I prefer Zoom. Yeah, I prefer it live. <laughs> I prefer YouTube. Uh, who, who is this? Uh, Jay from New York. Oh, nice, nice. I prefer the YouTube, nice. I prefer Zoom. YouTube, all right. And YouTube. So we are on record now. Let me share my screen. So guys, I'll just quickly review what we did the last time. On Monday, two days ago, we looked at the fact that you can take data in a certain feature space, input space, and you could lift it into or, or transform it into some other space in which the data gets linearized. So we saw this example of a desk Points on the desk are uh, blue, points outside the desk are yellow. There are two ways of doing it. Uh, one was uh, the transformation that I mentioned, uh, x1 prime being the square of x1 and so forth. And what it led to is uh, this uh, triangular situation. So in this little triangle in here, uh, everything is blue, outside the triangle it is yellow. And uh, it was one quick way to see that yes, transformation leads to um, simplifying the problem, linearizing the problem. So that the decision boundary, as you can clearly see, is just a line, is just the diagonal line, right? The off diagonal line rather. So, and the, the thing to observe there was, we did not necessarily lift to a higher dimension, isn't it? Then the other way is, and the same thing, just we can do it in multiple ways. So this other way that we could do it is, you could actually lift to a higher dimension. What you do is you create a variable x3, which is the, as, which is the square of the distance from the origin of each point. So you will, because it's the square of the distance, it is uh, this thing, x1 square plus x2 square, it will have a parabolic shape. And in the parabolic shape, the blue points will be uh, towards the bottom of the parabola, parabolic surface, and the yellow points will be uh, everything above the uh, above it. And so you can draw a hyperplane that we see, which is a constant hyperplane. X3 is equal to R squared. Means at a certain height from the, uh, from the ground, which is defined by X1, X2, you have X3 constant, and this ring, this uh, circular disk, is the disk that we see in the original data space. Uh, that becomes your decision. Uh, that is your uh, cutoff point. That's your decision boundary. But how are we defining the decision boundary in a higher dimension space? We, we have linearized it because for us, it is this x3 is equal to r square plane. It's just a simple flat horizontal plane that cuts through the parabolic surface. And it's an illustration of the fact that uh, you can take data, lift it to higher dimensions and uh, get away with linearizing it. And once you have that, you solve the problem. Right. Uh, oh, there is a, okay, I noticed there's something a little bit off I should do. Uh, this is A minus B, a magnitude for a polynomial kernel. I apologize, and this is some, not just one, some, uh, arbitrary number. So the kernel, uh, if I defined, it, is the simplest way to think of a kernel is the very simple kernel is just a dot product of two uh, vectors. But more generally, a kernel is the dot product of a dot product in the highest, higher dimensional space. So it is actually here also there's a typo. Uh, I think I was being absent-minded last time. So what it basically, let me explain this concept again because I seem to have goofed a little bit. Um, the kernel, the basic, the, the classic definition of a kernel is the kernel of a vector x and y is first what you do is you take x and y 
you take the points x, you take the point y, the x vector y, and you take them to some higher dimensional space, some space, need, not necessarily higher dimension. Uh, people often say that the space is uh, uh, infinite dimensional because they always think of radial basis functions. Not necessarily, but you just go to some higher dimensional space. And this is another vector. It's a vector, uh, some vector in a higher dimension space. And this becomes some vector in yet another higher dimension space, right? And basically the, it is the dot product between these two. It is a dot product in that space between these two uh, transformed points, right? That's it. And there, uh, yes, things uh, get much simpler. So that's the classic definition of a, uh, of a kernel. Kernel XY is actually nothing but the dot product in, is, is basically a dot product in a transformed space. Of, of the points, that's what it is. So Can we call phi as a transformation to that higher order space, or yes, in a, a sense? Transformation okay. to the higher dimensional space. So okay. for example, examples of phi are quite literally here. Yeah, uh, if we, if square we and all. Of the x square and so forth. Yeah, yeah. These, are Thank all you. The, these are all the mapping functions. So the whole magic of kernels is that, uh, the surprising magic is A, that you can do the transformation at all. And by the way, these spaces are called, you will often hear the word Hilbertian space or Hilbert space. Hilbert spaces are uh, very interesting. Now, um, uh, what's the most simple intuition I can give you? Uh, Hilbert spaces can be infinite dimensional. These are functional spaces, right? So potentially infinite dimension, they don't have to be. Like for example, in this example we saw, we got away with two dimensions. But they could have been uh, higher dimensions, sometimes infinite dimension spaces. So for us to wrap our head around infinite dimensions is a bit hard. But the way to do that is carry your intuition forward from three dimensions. Hilbertian spaces or Hilbert spaces are something that physicists absolutely love because all of quantum mechanics, all of the theories of physics ultimately more or less uh, have a deep connection to Hilbert spaces. And so uh, these sort of arguments that you see, let's map it to a higher dimension space, et cetera. This is uh, very close to the work mathematical physicists do, which is why you often find that in machine learning, a large part of the literature or the terminology quite often is borrowed from uh, theoretical physics, the concepts and so on and so forth, the mathematical physics, a lot of mathematics. So as always happens, math is and uh, theoretical subjects are couple of hundred years ahead or a hundred years ahead of engineering practices, because reality takes a lot of time to catch up, but the human imagination is way ahead. So a lot of this theory was developed a long time ago. And now they are, uh, they are proving to be very, very useful though a hundred years ago, uh, people didn't see all the use, practical use for it. Now it's all proving very useful. So simply put, as I said, the intuition is that think of dot products dot products capture a very rich relationship. Uh, dot product in the initial space or in the target space, they are all wonderful things. We did that. Then um, dimensionality reduction we talked about. We know just as a recap, the principal component analysis was wrapping up this uh, data, shrink wrapping it in an ellipsoid. Now, you may or may not be able to do it. If the data is linear, you can do it. If the covariance matrix is, if there is a positive covariance or a negative covariance, you can do it. But sometimes the covariance is zero. Like for example, in the data set two, we notice that you won't get much covariance because sometimes it's positively correlated, sometimes negatively and so on and so forth. So what can you do? You can go to another space. You can use the kernel mapping, go to another space, where the data gets linearized. So you apply a kernel mapping to go to that space. Once it is linearized, then if you're lucky, you can then do PCA in that space and actually come to a lower dimension space, right? Uh, which is why I mentioned that it is a good idea to do kernel PCA, right? The next thing we talked about is the, another concept, which is that of kernel distance which is actually different. The meaning or the word the kernel here is used in a, a slightly different man manner. Uh, 
Here the kernels are uh, distance kernels and we applied it to the KNN. We realized that when we take K is equal to one, one nearest neighbor, the decision boundaries are very, very, uh, you notice that they have high variance. On the other hand, when you take K equal to infinity, then the decision, or K is equal to 20 in this case, the decision boundary is just meaningless. It, it, it devolves to the baseline situation, the majority situation. So somewhere between K is equal to one and K is equal to 20 is the perfect answer, is the best value of K. K is the hyperparameter of your K nearest neighbor algorithm. And uh, it has been obviously a way to find that. You, you can try to find it. <coughs> As you increase K, you can see that the green line is better. The, the red is perhaps not so good. It starts getting bad. And by the time you reach this orange line, it's, it becomes, uh, or the Indian red line, it becomes sort of terrible. So you know that the uh, here the best solution potentially is the green solution. And you discover that through obviously um, cross-validation in the data. Now, one of the ways to mitigate this whole business of finding the perfect K is that you can use a distance kernel. You say that on the immediate neighbors have more influence than the far off neighbors, right? And the, so then the whole question is, what is your notion of distance? We talked about the Minkowski distance and the L norm. This is just a review of the, that. L is equal to half, looks like this, circle, uh, circle. L is equal to three. And L is equal to infinity, the infinite norm. Minkowski distance is something that you should really review. Oh, by the way, I didn't post those notes, the ones that I showed you guys from my book. I'll post it huh, to Slack. Then the K nearest neighbor. So obviously what you need is some distance function. Once you have a notion of distance, you need some function that decays with distance monotonically. It may not decay at all. It may just suddenly fall off or it may remain constant, but something, but it certainly shouldn't increase with distance or swing back and forth. It must have a monotonic behavior. So people have come up with all sorts of distance functions to, um, to uh, have the best K nearest neighbors. We went through a review of that last time. If you remember, we covered about a half a dozen or more uh, kernel, distance kernels. The, Mostly the parabolic kernel tends to do quite well, um, but almost all of them do equally well. They, you know, when you're trying to squeeze the last bit of performance or out of the model, uh, then the last thing you do is you tweak and you pick your kernel. But broadly speaking, the kernels, uh, in the beginning, the last thing you should worry about is uh, which kernel am I using? Right? Uh, focus on cleaning the data, getting your distance measure right, doing all those things right. Then as you, at a later stage, when you are beginning to do quite well with your KNN, kernel KNN, then also search for the best possible kernel. That brings up this whole thing about hyperparameter search that I would like to talk about today. See guys, do you notice that uh, in ML100, there were not that many knobs to turn. You had log linear regression, logistic regression, and so forth, LDA, QDA. They did not have too many hyperparameters built in. In fact, there were not any hyperparameters. But in ML200, we are sort of infested with hyperparameters in all our machine learning models. So the machine learning models say that if you tell me what the value of K is, we can build the best K nearest neighbor model for your data, but you have to find K. So what you have to do, you have to continuously go search for the best value of K, right? But then you have another dimension, which is the best kernel. So now you have to search in two dimensions, the best kernel and the best K. Now, usually what happens is a kernel KNN, uh, they sort of, mute the importance of the hyperparameter K. It still matters, but it doesn't matter so aggressively. So for example, the best K and the neighboring K values would all give more or less the same accuracy or the same performance. But, uh, but now you certainly do have a problem. You have to find the best K and you have to find the best kernel to use, distance kernel to use. So you're searching in two dimensions 
isn't it? And now suppose I had a few more hyperparameters in some kind of a model. Let's take random forest. What were the hyperparameters there? Uh, well, we are building trees. So how many trees to take? Well, there the simple answer is take a lot of trees. I start with typically 400 in most situations. Then, uh, and go up from there, depending on the complexity of the data set. Um, then even for very simple data set, I'll take 100, 200 trees. But then the depth of the tree, how deep should the tree be, right? Each tree that you're building, um, what is the max depth that you will allow? That is a hyperparameter. It can go all the way from one to uh, surprisingly large, you know, you can go whatever depth. Then at what cutoff, like how many points do you want to leave in the leaf node before you stop splitting? You can ask whether I use Gini or uh, cross or sorry, Gini or entropy as my impurity measure. Isn't it? So there are quite a few. And the other thing, of course, in random forest is at each split of the tree, how many features are you, what subset of the features or what uh, are more formally, what uh, subspace in the feature space should you consider for splitting at each split in the tree? You don't want to take all the features, but how many features do you want to take? Just one feature, two feature, three feature, all hundred features, square root of, uh, uh, square root of the number of features, which would be 10, log of the number of features. These are all choices to be made. So, and at the end of the day, in, in the more general situation, in practical situations for one data set, some of the hyperparameters may matter quite a bit, but for um, some other hyperparameters may not matter at all. But a priori, before you do this experiment, you don't know what the situation is. Uh, are we together? You don't know that. So what do you do? You have to search. You have to search this hyperparameter space to find the optimal combination of hyperparameters. But by now you realize that the choices are many. Uh, it is a combinatorial explosion. Even if you take discrete number of uh, uh, discrete values for the hyperparameter, so for example, if you take the depth of the tree is discrete, one, two, three, four, five, and so forth, the number of, of features, max number of features to consider is discrete. The Gini and uh, Gini versus entropy is again a choice, binary choice. Number of estimators is again uh, up to you. These are all discrete, but let us say that in each case, you, you had a choice of about uh, 10 possible values. Uh, by the time you have four hyperparameters, you realize that 10 times 10 times 10 times 10 is a thousand. So what you are doing is you are building a thousand models to find which model is the best on cross-validation, isn't it? So that's a pretty aggressive computational load. So this way of brute force are just creating a grid of the values and searching for it uh, used to be called the grid search method. Yeah. The grid search method for hyperparameter tuning has been a classic. It is, a, it is also a staple diet for interviews. So when you, should you go for interviews and your interviewer says, uh, well, what is grid search? Now, you know, or the other way they can say is, how do you find the best values for the hyperparameter? So quite often they're expecting you to say grid search. And so you should start by saying, well, this is the way you could do it. Uh, but remember, this is not the optimal way. Right. But then the other thing you could do for reasons that we'll understand uh, later, or maybe today itself, if we get time, you can actually do randomized search, take random values in each of the dimensions, hyperparameter dimensions, and uh, uh, then search. And then what you do is once you find the best value, then you search in the neighborhood of that value to find even better values and so forth. You sort of zoom in, you can do that. That's called randomized search. It is from experience, we now know it is better than uh, this brute force, grid search. And <clears throat> lastly, these days, actually, there's quite a bit of theory on doing this in an optimal, uh, in a much more efficient manner. And uh, that is the domain, or that's one of the topics that we'll cover in automated ML, automatic uh, like ML. One of its uh, main uh, burden is how do you do optimal hyperparameter search? Because you are not just searching along the hyperparameters. Remember, you're also searching along many, uh, many algorithms. So for example, if it is a classification problem, 
then given the no free lunch theorem, you don't know which of the algorithms, which of the classifiers would be best. And each classifier comes with its own bag of hyperparameters. Isn't it guys? So the search for that becomes computationally very, very expensive. You need a systematic way to go about doing it. That is the new frontier. Um, I would like to, uh, we are running out of sessions, of course, and the syllabus of this course, we have uh, two more topics, regularization and, uh, uh, and gradient boosting, both of which I would like to cover before the course is up. So we'll do automated ML in one of the extra sessions. We'll certainly start the bootcamp with automated ML. So anyway, that's the summary guys of the last time. Uh, I would like to now move on to the topic for today, which is a continuation of what we talked. Now, today was supposed to be a lab, but uh, I thought about it and I sort of changed the decision. I felt that regularization is such an important topic, we cannot miss it. So we should do it today and we should move the lab work to a regular. We'll do it over Saturday. So I swapped it. I said, we'll do uh, regularization on the weekend no instead we'll do it today and we'll do the lab session over saturday afternoon i hope uh, that is all right with you and the boosting is also an important topic it needs its own lab so the next week we'll give to boosting and to its lab instead okay? the recommended yeah. we are going to anyway cover in the math course so it it will get covered we don't need to worry about that this is the way we do. So let's do it properly so that we get to do a lot of laps in each of these. Um, today, because we have already covered support vector machines and this notion of kernel distance is a bit theoretical, uh, there was no very uh, explicit lab that I could have given. So instead I decided I'll do um, regularization so that it, regularization lab is really important to do and we'll do that on Saturday. Sure. Any questions, guys, before we start? Yeah. Can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. So when you go to, when you say, you know, uh, we can go to higher order space, right? But if we do not know that space, like let's say example of size and weight for cow and duck, right? But we want to go to higher order space, but we do not know, let's say, color or other mm -hmm. thing. Then what, what do we do then? No, no, see, you have to know that ultimately the higher dimension space is manufactured out of the input space, the input space. So if you don't know, the machine learning algorithm won't be able to discover. See, it doesn't know what it doesn't know, mm -hmm. right? That's the problem with all machine learning algorithms. Remember, we talked about the irreducible error in ML100 introduction. Right. But that is the irreducible error that you can't get away with. It is true with human beings also, you know, when we uh, believe something is to be true, we, we base that judgment on what we know. But there remains the fact that we don't know what we don't know. We can just be aware of the fact that there must be things we don't know. Right? I hope from one of the things we learn here is yeah. that um, what we don't know uh, may fatally compromise our understanding. It's almost, uh, it is obvious, but it is the irreducible error in machine learning. Correct. And that no algorithm will be able to surmise. You have to bring it to the table. <clears throat> but, but, so uh, I think question is that, you know, when you say for kernel, you do not have to know that space. All you have to do is dot product in that space, right? That is true. The kernel trick is, see, what happens is that some of these ways to map are quite powerful, like linear and polynomial are good. And uh, so, for example, you know that polynomial will work for the river data set easily. Mm -hmm. uh, then, uh, then linear would have worked easily for the straightforward classifier one problem. Then the radial basis function works for a vast class of uh, problems. When you use RBF, you're actually talking of infinite dimensional spaces. At that particular moment, the infinite dimensional space is so rich, you're pretty much guaranteed a linear decision boundary, more or less, a very high probability that you'll solve the problem. Right? Yeah, you'll okay. The problem. So you don't worry about that. You, you take these kernels and go. Question that arises is, could you hand construct a kernel, a mapping, 
just by, as a feature engineering exercise, think it through and apply, give your own mapping to the higher dimension. Mm -hmm. If you can do that, all power to you. Actually, it leads to some very efficient solutions because computational runtime with the RBF kernel is quite high. You know, you're taking it to very high dimensions and you're searching for the solution there. If you can uh, do it with your own homegrown kernel, the performance is better, even the computational times are better and so on and so forth. But if you can't, RBFs are very powerful. Generally, they do solve your problem. And then the other interesting thing is that obviously it is the dot product that matters. Mm -hmm. The kernel trick, the, the heart of the kernel trick, it is not a theoretical breakthrough, but it is a computational uh, sort of a cheat way or a shortcut. You manage to not discover the mapping function itself, but you discover that whatever mapping function there is, you discovered the dot product of it. And if you can reformulate your problem in terms of dot products, in terms of kernels, you have a winner. And that is why kernels became so, uh, people said, wow, uh, that is amazing. Given that that is true, can we uh, then reformulate a large class of problems as kernel problems. Right? That's how the whole kernel method thing started. And they were very, very surprised, actually. You can write many things. And if you, with a little bit of thought, you can rewrite it as a kernel function. Mm -hmm. Amazing. Just, just surprising. It just shows that how powerful dot products are. Okay. So a uh, lot, lot of work uh, in that space. Thanks. Any other questions, guys? So guys, remember that uh, we are coming to the close of the workshop. Uh, we still have two important topics to cover, regularization and uh, uh, boosting, both of which needs dedicated labs. So uh, we are one session short. So I use this session for regularization and we will have Saturday. So do treat it as a mandatory session, guys. And we must finish the syllabus, uh, which is that we must do the lab in regularization and next week we'll give to boosting. So, all right, so I'll move on to the regularization now. Uh, what is regularization? See, when you, uh, and I'll take the example of a polynomial regression to, to sort of motivate <clears throat> the concept of regularization. Suppose I give you data, uh, let's say that, and let's, let's take a simple situation of X and Y, where we are saying we are in search of X is equal to some function, some function. And let us say that the, there is a ground truth you don't know. There is a ground truth. This is the ground truth of the data. This is ground truth of the data. And let's say that you have these points. Right. Uh, let me take these points here and uh, Uh, let, let me say. Now, I'll just take these few points. I hope I can illustrate the problem that I have with this. Uh, so I will keep this point and let's see what sort of curves we can draw through this. One, curve, one thing you could do is you could say, hey, this, th okay, again, let me be clear with the terminology. G is our ground truth. It is that which you don't know. It is the function that has actually produced the data. What is our task? Our task is to build a machine learning model, which is, uh, let me just make it Y hat, right? You are, you are going to pick a hypothesis, going back to the basics, hypothesis function, such that y hat is approximately y for most values, isn't it? In other words, y, the real value is y hat plus some error, and you want this error to be small. A good model is one that makes fairly accurate um, predictions that are close to reality, the close to the real values of y. Now, if you take the case of polynomials, uh, polynomial regression. You realize that you can write fx as um, beta naught plus beta one x 
x plus beta 2 x square plus and you can keep going on to beta n x to the power n. Right? Do we remember this thing, guys? This is your polynomial regression equation, eh? approximating the data, trying to fit the data to this polynomial. Yeah. Now the question is, what is n? Here, the big problem is, what is n? What is the best n? Trouble is, if you take uh, n, essentially becomes the hyperparameter of the model, isn't it? It has, and so you have a headache. You have to build models and over and over and over again and see which value uh, leads to better results. You can keep trying. But so one of the questions that you can ask is, let's see what happens and see if there is a shortcut through this. If I take n is equal to one, what will this look like? n is equal to one would be this, right? In simple terms, what would you call that? Straight line. A straight line. Yeah. So you can put a straight line that is uh, like this, isn't it? This is n is equal to one. You could. Yeah. You take no, two, and perhaps you could let me take a color. Hello, yes, we lost is you. anybody able to hear? Me? Yeah, we lost you after you said n equals one. Okay, can you hear me again now? Yeah, now yes. yes. Uh, uh, all right, let me repeat what I said. For n is equal to one, it is the straight line. For n is equal to two, it would be some parabolic curve. I don't know if this is exactly the one, but we'll assume that this is the one, n is equal to two. And then for n is equal to three, let me take another color. Uh, why am I having this color? This color. So n is equal to three, maybe that it is a, uh, This one, right? Let me make the points big and bold so that we remember those points. And then what about n? So it is two bands, n is equal to three. What about n is equal to five? What will happen? What will happen is as you go to higher, and I will pretend because I, we should mathematic, we should programmatically uh, draw this out to see which one fits, but uh, just humor me. Uh, this is too fat. Um, let me take something like this. Okay. So if you were to take this, it would be, it needs a four bands, right? So it would be something like one, two, three. Let me take it like that. I'm just motivating the example. Uh, if we actually did it in a, in a uh, model, it might look something different. Maybe I should have done before I came here. So this is n is equal to five. What do you notice happening? And let me, uh, as a, uh, without actually having done that, let me say that, suppose I had done that uh, for n is equal to 10, what would it look like? So now I need nine bands and your data will begin to look, oh gosh, it's so too fat again. Uh, your data will look begin to look like uh, this. It will look like uh, and more more than that actually uh, it will be look like this something like this because you need nine bands one two three four five six seven actually I didn't introduce nine bands we need to make it even more curvy. So uh, who knows, uh, we need to add a couple of bends right here. Uh, make this more like uh, this. So what happens is if you go to n is equal to 10, you have a complete fit to the data. It seems to go through all the points, isn't it? But do you think n is equal to 10, something like this, 
is the correct solution? What does your intuition say? What is the problem that this model is having? Overfit. And overfit. It has overfit the, the data. So what happens is the more parameters you have, polynomial terms you have, the more knobs you have to turn, you have to turn in the data. It's a very flexible model. I'll give you an intuition. Imagine that it is a sort of a, what do we call it? Uh, are you familiar? Well, think of it as silly putty, something like silly putty, right? Uh, if it is very stiff, you can't bend it. it. It's like the n is equal to one line. Now, gradually, as you make it more and more pliable, you can bend it more and more, isn't it? And so you have bent it. Actually, silly putty is a bad example. But think of something that has some degree of elasticity to it. The more elasticity it has, the more you can bend it. So the higher degree of polynomial, the more pliable it is, the more you can bend it. What happens is if you take a high degree polynomial, you have too much elasticity. You can just fit the polynomial, that curve to the entire data perfectly. But you know that that data is just a representation. You take another sample of the data and this curve will be all wrong, isn't it? You will end up drawing a completely different curve to this data. So how do you cure this problem? This problem is the problem of overfitting, isn't it? So you do know that flexible models do tend to fit the data, but you don't want it to overfit. So just as a reminder, the total error, the total error of a model, total error of a model model is equal to the bias error plus the variance error plus what else a bias sorry the uh, the variance error plus what guys do you remember what is the irreducible other irreducible error irreducible error right irreducible error thank you kate reducible error it is the, it the captures noise as well as that which you don't know, that which the model doesn't know. So see, if you try to reduce bias, variance increases. Are we together guys? That has been the bias variance trade-off. So uh, let me draw the bias variance trade-off again. And by now, you should be quite familiar, I hope, with this. So as you increase the complexity of the model, for example, in the case of polynomial, as you increase n, the, two, the errors, right? The, the bias error of a model, as you build more and more complex models, will keep going down like this, right? What about the variance errors, the variance errors will start the, actually, let me use another color so that I can use white for the final solution. So let, let's say that the, your bias errors go like this. They keep on decreasing the more flexible you make the model. Your variance errors, on the other hand, begins to go like this. And let me give names to this. Errors. And this is errors. So you know that somewhere in between those two points is the perfect line. It is this line. Um, and let me use white itself, but a thicker version of white, hopefully. So the total error, if you add these two up, you notice that it goes like this. And whatever the value of K here is, this value, this is the best model that you can build, right? So this is the best approximation. Right? So suppose Fn, I will say uh, of degree N, uh, to the ground truth 
it is the closest you can come to the ground truth. And this error that you are left with is obviously the part that you can't get rid of. Right? Uh, it remains at the end of the day. It's the residual error for you. Are we together? It's made up of whatever little bias error remains, whatever little variance error remains, and the irreducible error. So uh, as a recap, guys, does this look uh, ring a bell? Are we familiar with this so far? We did that just a couple of months ago in ML 100. So this is it. So now the question is, here you have this big surge from here to there. Can we, the question to ask is, what happens if you make an overtly simple model, a biased model, a stick model? Its errors will be hard to deal with. There, it's a sort of fatal, you can't uh, get rid of that. On the other hand, if you make your model too complex, right, you're too flexible, the question that arises is, going back to this data, do you notice that the complex model, n is equal to 10 or n is equal to five, a green and the pink lines, they have too many oscillations, right? They seem to be oscillating quite a bit unnecessarily. So it is tempting to ask, can we apply a damping factor? Can we dampen the oscillations? Right? It's bouncing around too much in the feature space, this curve. Can we reduce the bounce? Can we dampen it? Are we together? Because if we could dampen it somehow, then it could be, it could solve a problem. We could start with a flexible model and we could dampen it down. So the basic idea is that, can we start with let's say a green line or the pink line, but somehow dampen it down to the yellow line. Now the yellow line is the perfect line, right? In, in this case seems to be the best model. That is uh, N is equal to three. Isn't it guys? So the idea is suppose I took a more complex model like n is equal to five, can I bring in some mechanism that in spite of my taking a more complex model, the things, the extra degrees, the extra flexibility somehow magically disappears and it begins to approximate the yellow line, the yellow curve. That is the intuition of this whole, um, this whole problem or this whole bag of tricks called regularization, this, uh, this technique called regularization. Are we together? It is also called shrinkage, shrinkage methods. In fact, your book calls it shrinkage methods. The statisticians call it shrinkage method, shrinkage. Now, uh, the machine learning crowd tends to use the word regularization more often. Shrinkage means you shrink all of these oscillations and you make it look like that yellow curve. Right. That is what we will learn to do. But for us, so the answer to that is yes, you can do that. It turns out there's a very elegant way of uh, uh, solving this problem. And the solution to that comes from uh, a field. It's a very simple bit of mathematics called, uh, and it is a problem in constrained optimization. Now I already, optimization. I already uh, sort of introduced you to the concept of constraint optimization in the support vector machines thing. In other words, find the maximal margin hyperplane constrained by a certain budget of mistakes that you can make, remember? So we will use the same things of constraint optimization today. But before I go into the mathematics of it, um, I just wanted to say that, see, this theory is very elegant. It's one of the crown jewels, actually, of uh, linear methods. The fact that you can take a fairly complicated uh, polynomial, which is still considered linear because it's linear in the polynomial terms, and then regularize it and get to the solution. Regularization is one way. There is another way, actually, to solve this problem. The other way is to just bring the other way. Let me just write it in a sidebar. The other way, other option, and probably the preferred one, are probably preferred, probably. Preferred, something is wrong with my preferred, it's a spelling. Uh, preferred, 
way, the preferred way would be what? Get more data. Get more data. So what happens is if you get more data somehow, it is possible to get more data. Suppose you have points like this. Lots and lots of data. And I hope I, I, I'm, I'm not making enough number of dots, but imagine that this is very densely packed with data here. Yeah. Then what happens is the curve that tries to overfit, it won't get enough flexibility. It may sort of ripple around a little bit, wobble around a little bit, but it will ultimately look like the, even a high degree polynomial will look like this. Do you notice the small wiggles that I have put in the line? There may be small ripples or wiggles in there, but broadly speaking, because you know a 10 degree polynomial needs 10, nine wiggles, it will still be there, but it will be unnoticeable. Right? So what has happened is you have given it a lot of data and it is forced to fit with a lot of data. So overfitting disappears or gets muted. So um, here, overfitting or high variance, if you want to put it this way, the high variance gradually is suppressed, is suppressed. Right, so, so you can, and this is by the way, the preferred way, if you can get more data then do it. So what is the catch here? Why not just use more data? Why, why develop a whole uh, new theory of regularization and so forth? Can somebody guess? It can be expensive to get data. It is expensive to get data. Yes, that is very true. That's one reason. See, or it the, might not be available. Like if it's a rare cancer, like the data yeah. might not be available. Yes, that's the point. In a lot of fields, data is very, very hard to get and you, you have to make do, you want to model with what you have. You can't say that, uh, it's like, you know, asking for food on a silver platter. Well, they may not be. Uh, so you do want to make do with what you have and more data may not be available. Another way to look at it is, see, remember I told you that the higher dimensional spaces are very sparse. No amount of data will look enough because all the data disappears in that space. So overfitting happens when the data is sparse and you, you're fitting a very flexible model to it. When you do some of these modern algorithms, let's say a deep neural network, which you will do shortly in the next workshop, can you guess how many parameters we're talking about? Here we are talking about a polynomial of degree 10. In a typical deep neural network, how many parameters do we typically talk about? A uh, few millions to a billion. Exactly. So if I am right, yeah, millions of parameters, even the basic ones have millions of parameters. And then uh, I think GPT-3 has what, 500 million parameters or something like that. So the, high, the parameter space is just ginormous. So you might come there with 10 million data points, but your 10 million data points are a drop in the bucket as far as those, that huge, huge hyperparameter space is concerned. So overfitting is a very serious problem there. This, uh, this uh, getting to the wrong answers, or overfitting problem. And so you have a lot of overfitting errors, high variance errors in your problem. And so the theory of regularization, you need to find a way to regularize. So today, I'll, uh, hopefully, based on how much time we have, I will teach you uh, at least how many techniques are three. I'll try to teach you at least a few techniques of regularization. And uh, on Saturday, we are going to do a lab on those, uh, those techniques. Eh? So how do we do that? Let, let, us, let us go back to the basics. Suppose you have a function y, uh, let's go back again, write down what we wrote before. We are trying to find a function y hat is a function of x, right? And you know the ground truth, y is actually a function of gx, right? So you know that y, y hat, hat. Uh, y is basically 
y hat plus some irreducible some errors that that get made in your model and your your pursuit is to find an fx that approximates the ground truth right this is our ground truth how in the world are we going to do that let's go back to basics we have a we have a loss function the error function we know that each time in so let's look at regression as an example and this will generalize over to uh, classification also what is the error term for each data point the error is equal to y minus y hat isn't it yeah this is your residual now your sum squared error was summed over all i do you remember that guys this was your sum squared error Yes. Now, given this, and now what you can do, uh, this error, if you just expand it out as y minus y hat i square, this comes to, and let's do the little bit of mathematics here. This comes to y i minus what was y hat, beta naught. Uh, let me just take the term beta one x one. Right, plus beta two x two etc etc. But let me stay with one dimension for the time being. It is this error. Do you agree? And we can sort of uh, add more dimensions to it. It's not going to change the thing. And obviously, I shouldn't forget my summation i. This is your error term, guys. Yeah. Uh, any mysteries here so far? Mm -hmm. So when you have this, you know that when you are doing your problem, a data is fixed during learning. Data is fixed, of course, because you're learning on the data. So the values of X and Y are not changing. X, I, Y, I. changing. So this E, what is it really a function of? E is therefore a function of? Beta naught and beta one. Yes, beta naught, beta one, isn't it? This is what is really happening here. Let me remove this sidebar line here. This is, uh, this is it. So I can write, therefore, this equation as E beta naught beta one and then I can go to beta two, et cetera, et cetera, if I so wish, is the summation over square of y i minus beta naught minus beta one x i, right? And if I want to add higher order terms, I can do that, but let's stay with one dimension. Uh, this is what it is. Right? Now, if you expand this out for each of these terms, you'll realize that it expands out as y i square plus a beta naught square plus beta one x one x i square, right? Uh, plus minus two beta naught y it's i square, it's right? square of times minus square. two uh, beta one y i x i minus, uh, and obviously we'll have to put a big summation over all of those. Uh, and uh, what else is there? We, we missed one more term. Uh, uh, minus, uh, beta not beta one beta not xi. beta one yeah two xi xi xi, xi right so right, if you look at this equation right and then um, it's a it's a bit of a, a long set of terms but do you know that what is the highest power of beta that you see here in this equation beta not square is the square term right beta not or beta one square so you would agree that this is this equation uh, this equation is quadratic, i.e. e beta naught beta one is, and this is the important thing, quadratic radic in beta. Isn't it? It's quadratic in the betas. Yeah. So now quadratic curves, Looked like how many bends does a quadratic curve have? One. 
one. And so in higher dimensions, how many, the generalization of a curve is a surface or a hypersurface, in this case, just a surface. So what will it look like? Let's look at this axis error. And this is this. This is a beta naught, let's say axis. So now remember, we are not in the data space. We are in the hypothesis space. We keep using this word hypothesis space. We are in the hypothesis space. So here, if you remember, we talked about this. This is just a recap, guys, of what we did. This is uh, for each value of beta naught, beta one, there will be a certain amount of error, right? And uh, this is your curves. And there will exist a point, a perfect beta naught. Let me just call it beta naught, beta one with a tilde on it. The perfect values, the best values, the optimal, value where e minimum of e minima is achieved is achieved achieved in other words what you are searching for in this space is this point this point beta naught beta 1 represents in the beta space, right? Uh, let me just write it as a beta, well, tilde vector, but okay, I'll just write it like that. This is what, it is the point where it is that value of beta naught beta one, where this achieves the minimum the error achieves the minima, right? That's just a summary way of putting it. What value, what argument of beta naught beta one will minimize the error? That represents our uh, point here. Okay. Let me draw this picture a little bit better. Uh, we see the parabola actually, I need a bigger screen. That is AVZ or that is ARG? Argmin, argmin. Argmin, okay. Uh, this word is, uh, let me say, arc. I mean, the reason I introduce this word today is because you'll encounter it in books. So gradually, you notice that slowly I'm intru introducing the mathematical notation in little droplets. So, which value of the argument? What are the arguments to this function? Beta naught, beta one, right? So, which argument will minimize the function? Argument means. Let me write this word down. The definition of argument. Arg min of a function is those ar argument values that will this is the definition of argument huh? by definition def so likewise, you can define the arg max, you know, if you want to maximize something, the counter term or the equivalent term would be arg max. Arg max would be those values of the argument that will maximize the function. So the words like arg min, arg max are pretty common in this literature. Arg max, these words, uh, they keep occurring in the ML literature. Right? And this is just, a, do you realize that this box that I have here, it is a very succinct way of saying, what are we searching for? Our optimization journey is to find this thing, beta naught, beta one tilde, the beta tilde. Does that make sense, guys? We are just recapitulating what we did in ML 100 here. Uh, but if you have not understood, speak up, guys. Eh? I'm not getting enough feedback. You want me to repeat? I'll be happy to repeat. Uh, so, uh, Asaf, uh, I might have missed it, but is this beta zero and uh, or the beta zero tilde and beta one tilde? This okay. is a specific case for one y one error, right? Or yeah, yeah. So what happens is that see in your model, right, your model is this beta naught plus beta one x, right? Based on this, we come into the we create the error function beta naught beta one error function. It look in the hypothesis space. It looks like this surface. Right. This is the error surface. What are you looking for? You're so looking for the point of minimum data error. Point or it is for all the summation of the data point? It is the summation of all the data points. 
E is, yes, you're right. See, E né? is the summation over the errors from all the data points. You notice this. The definition of E is that it is, a, it is this. Remember, we started out with this derivation. E by definition is the total error over all data points. So this is the total error, which is the sum of square of all the residuals. And then we expand it out mathematically. And then we notice that when we expand it out, it's a quadratic function in the beta naught beta one, right? So in the hypothesis space, whose axis is beta naught, a parameter space, hypothesis space or parameter space. Hypothesis space, it looks like this parabola parabolic surface. Is this, uh, is, did you get that? Uh, like, should I re-explain? Uh, no, uh, I, I understand the uh, parabolic part, but uh, when we are trying to minimize, so is it getting minimized for only one data point or how no, can we no, ensure no. that it is minimized for the summation of the data points? See, E is a function. E is derived from the data points, no? summation over all the data points. But once we have created the summation over all the data points, the only things, the only knobs that you can turn are the beta naught, beta one, right? Because the points are there, you have calculated the total error for any given value of beta naught, beta one, you know what the total error will be. Okay. And so you're trying to find that total error is also called the sum squared error, SSE, sum squared error. Sum squared error. Got it. Yeah. Got it, okay. So now comes the theory. So this is a recap of what we did in ML Hambridge. Here, the, yeah. now here is the intuition. Uh, see what happens is, when you add higher degree polynomial terms, so you are you're, you're expanding your hypothesis space, isn't it? So See, add polynomial. Go ahead. Yeah, the the definition that you wrote, the argument of a function, is those argument values that will minimize the function. I, I didn't get this last part. That will minimize the function. Are, are you by that? Do you mean the length of? Give an example. Example. Let us take one dimension. Y is equal to x square plus ten. Right. Now, tell me at what value this function is y as a fx. Let me write it at this uh, y or fx. So what, what value, what will minimize of X will minimize the function? Zero. X equal to zero. Yeah. X is equal to zero, right? So you say that X is equal to zero is the arg min of fx. This point, the value x is equal to zero, is the arg min of the function. It is the place where function is minimum. But the minima of the function is what? Minima fx is what? that will be equal to 10, because if you put X is equal to zero, it will be 10, right? So the point X is equal to zero, FX is equal to 10 represents your minima, represents the, and you can call it Y. And so you can say Y is equal to this. Does this look simple guys? Right? So if you plot it out, it will look like this. And this will be 10. 
So this point, x is equal to zero, represents your uh, argument, the point at which this curve achieves its minimum. So, uh, so we will write it. So the, the way you would say that is argument, uh, if you want to use this notation, argument, that is x, fx is equal to zero. In other words, the value of x that minimizes the function is zero. Is the uh, are we is this getting any clearer, guys? Yes. Right. Yeah. So this is the this is the meaning of argument, right? So for example, let me deliberately uh, complicate this problem. Uh, I'll make it x is equal to three. Now, what value of x would minimize this problem? Can you guess? Three. three. So, uh, so you sh because zero is special, I don't want to use zero here. Uh, so this is it. And so this would be, argmin would be three here and argmin here would be three, right? And uh, on the other hand, the min of min fx would be 10. The minima that you would achieve would still be 10. That's the concept of argmin, guys. So what we are searching now, let's bring it back to our real life. What we are saying is we are finding that hypothesis in simple terms, those parameter values, beta naught, beta one, that will minimize our error term. Is this, think about it for a moment. Is this clear guys? If not, I'll repeat it again. Anybody who wants me to repeat, say so. Uh, Asif, can you repeat it again? <laughs> Yeah, see what happens is, let me put it in a slightly different way. See, when you have a total error, that error is associated with some hypothesis, some value of beta naught, beta one, some parameter values, because your hypothesis is parameterized by beta naught, beta one. So any value of beta naught, beta one that you take, there will be a certain degree of error, right? In simple terms, in this beta naught, beta one plane, this plane that is there, Right. This is your hypothesis plane, right? Let me call it the hypothesis plane or space, whichever word you want to. For every point here, there is a certain degree of error. Any point you take associated with it is a certain degree of error, isn't it? And so what you're trying to do is finding that point where the error is the least, because you're trying to build a model which makes the least prediction error, isn't it? And therefore, that is your, uh, that's your best solution. That is the best you can do. You can just learn your way towards that. And just as a recap in ML100, what we would do is we would start at a random value and then we would do gradient descent here. So in other words, uh, around this point, there used to be this, uh, remember, this is the projection of these shadows of these circles, or these are called contour maps. Here, do you remember this, guys? I hope you remember this because we'll use this to move forward towards regularization now. The oh, yes. surface, yeah, yeah it's it's uh, shadows of these circles, these contour maps. Uh, 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 sort of level surfaces are these. And so you take a random point, suppose you start here, it has a huge error. And what you're looking for is you're, you're finding your way. Center to the minimum. To the center. You're just finding your way through gradient descent towards the center. This is your gradient descent. Asif? Yes? So, uh, then is the argument sort of either very close to or just the irreducible error then? Uh, no, not necessarily. See, even when you reach the minima, you may have reducible as well as irreducible error. But what does that mean? See, for that model, it is the lowest error. But you could build a better model. You, you, can, you can dial in the complexity, take a different value of n and so forth, isn't it? So it and it still has, so in other words, there is still residual bias and residual variance along with irreducible present in the model, in the, in the minima. Okay. In other words, uh, let me go back to the terms. 
um, where we define the error, where is it that we define? Yes, a, bi a bias errors, yes. Look at this pink equation. See, irreducible error will remain. It represents that which you don't know. But if you look here at this optimal point, right? Do you notice that the pink line is not zero? The value of pink is not zero. There is still bias error as well as there is yellow line is not zero. Mm -hmm. There is also variance error. Isn't it? Yeah. That's the thing. So even at your best model points, there is still some bias error, some variance error, and there is irreducible error. In fact, uh, just uh, we did decision trees. What happened? Even with pruning and so forth, it was not possible to reduce the irreducible, I mean, the, by, the variance error is too much. No, it's still stuck there. So we went to random forest, which made the thing a little bit better. There are many adaptations of random forest that try to solve that problem of overfitting. So that's that. So far, so good, guys. So let me recap what we just did. So we are saying that in the hypothesis space, first of all, okay, recap of what we just reviewed. Recap of recap. Error term, which is a function of beta naught, beta one, et cetera, et cetera, is equal to y minus beta naught minus beta one x i square. This is the sum squared error. And as uh, somebody asked over all data points, data points. Now, in the hypothesis space, so the data exists in real space, right? Whatever the data looks, it exists in the XY space, the real data space. But in the hypothesis space where the coordinates are, uh, by the way, uh, a bigger drawing board is on the way. So uh, I won't have to scroll up and down so much uh, in a few days. Um, beta node, beta one error. In this space, the hypothesis space, the we have a, we have a parabolic, or a surface or this convex surface, which achieves a minima at some best point, uh, beta. I'll, I'll just represent it as beta till there. You can assume beta naught, beta one is built out of it. Uh, beta naught, so beta one, it is this. But I'll just represent it as a beta tilde vector. Right? This is it, what exists. And these things, they form contour lines. These, uh, if you project down this, uh, there are these contour lines in this hypothesis. So if you start with some random point, you will have to find a path going to this. And this journey is your journey of gradient descent. So we won't uh, recap uh, that, I mean, uh, but if you want to remember the rules of the gradient descent, it, the, it was beta minus alpha grad of E and the derivative of E. So this is your ML 100. So go back and look at the notes. You'll see that this is your gradient descent step. Gradient descent step. In other words, go opposite to the gradient, right? If you're here, go opposite to the gradient. Actually, you know what? Let's go through the derivation of this gradient descent. How many of you would want me to recap the gradient descent step? Can you do it, please? Okay, ah, yes. let's do that. But if you do that, it's uh, 825. Guys, give me about, uh, let's take a break, actually. Okay, uh, let's take a 10 minutes break, 10, 15 minutes break, and then come back. I need to have some water and we'll take it from there. I'll stop the recording for a moment. Guys, uh, use this break to go back and look at your ML 100 notes. 
so that this becomes fresh in your mind eh? because we are going to break new ground. This, all of this is a recap of what we did in ML100 in the introductory workshop. All right. So uh, please, please take the 15, 20 minutes to recap this. I will pause the recording. Okay, so it is uh, eight thirty. Uh, should we meet at about uh, should uh, twenty minutes, guys? Take it seriously and huh? do use it to recap uh, your notes back from ML hundred. Should we take a twenty minute break? Yes, please. Okay, yeah, let's do that. All right, guys, and see you at eight fifty then. Everyone should make sure they're muted, please.
Three more minutes. Hello, Kamya. Could you remind me of uh, your father's phone number? Kamya, you're on mute. If you are hearing me, uh, do please uh, remind me of uh, your father Ramki's phone number. Huh? Guys, we're going to start in a minute. It's going to be 8.50. Are we all here? I hope we are here. I hope you got some time to recap what we had done from the notes. Yes, sir. Nice. is 850 guys and I'm starting. So uh, to motivate this, I will just take a simple example of what a gradient about gradients um, to illustrate a point. See, if you have a function, let me take a function y is equal to um, basically your fx that looks like this, right? It could, for example, be something plus something x squared or something like this. This is your x-axis and this is your y-axis. Right? I want to explain what gradient descent is, the basic intuition. And again, I'll move a little bit faster because we have done this before. Gradient descent is a way to start from any random point and reach this destination, this point. What is this point? This point is your arc in our new language, argmin of fx, isn't it? It is that special value of x, x tilde, uh, where uh, this function is minimized so far. So how do we reach this? How do we, how do we come to that? There's a very interesting thing to observe here. And that observation has to do with the slope of the line. Look at this. What is the slope here, guys? At, at x tilde, slope is 
is it flat yeah. rising up or falling flat is flat slope is zero now the definition of slope is let me just remind you the definition of slope is increase in height height for unit movement unit increase of x unit increase of x so suppose i in, suppose i'm here at this point if i make a small increase delta x improve uh, increase delta x and this is the uh, step forward so i would go from the point this point to this point so have i increased or decreased in height so when i go from this point a to b decrease let decrease. it create a negative slope x and b is equal to x plus delta x right the height decreases so you say that in the vicinity of x the slope is negative right uh, the slope so uh, y decreases in going from a to b i e from x to x plus delta x isn't it guys so y decre decreases in going to that and so the conclusion we have is slope is therefore at a slope is negative negative now let's look at the point uh, this point let me call this point uh, x prime right or at x prime if i go a little bit a unit distance forward delta x forward i go from let's say c to d right so when going from c to d from delta x prime c is equal to x prime to d is equal to x prime plus delta x right do we increase or decrease in height did we what did we what did we agree it increased positive slope yes it increased so we increase we went up the height increased so slope is positive slope is also called the derivative of a function right slope is is called the derivative of a function so we can say uh, it's usually written as a uh, dfx dx or dy uh, dx and sometimes for shorthand people often use a prime to signify right pronounced as y prime right they often use this i wouldn't because i tend to use x prime y prime just for a points so i will not be using this notation right so not be using this notation will not use this notation so these notations are, are common and i'm just recapitulating the calculus that you have learned uh, in high school and this is just a recap of what positive so here the slope is negative negative here the slope is positive now comes a interesting thought guys um, at this point suppose you are at a if you want to 
your, your goal is to go home, to find the optimal point, this, right? So suppose you are at A and therefore this is the error. In which direction should you go to decrease the error, decrease the Y? Should I go in the positive X direction or negative X direction at A? Positive X. In the positive X direction. Right, so you can say at A, at A, we should go, go in the positive X direction. Slope is negative. negative. So dy dx is less than zero at this point. What about B? At C, where is C? Let's go back and look at C. And uh, again, actually, one of the nice things is uh, uh, this writing surface is somewhat small. Uh, there is a bigger writing surface coming, so we won't have to do so much scrolling back and forth. At C, if you are at C, guys, do you want to go C? Uh, this is the F FC. And do you want to go in the positive X direction or negative X direction to decrease Y? Negative X. At negative X direction. At C, we should go, go in the negative X direction. Here, slope is positive. Is positive. So do you notice uh, something very interesting? If the slope is positive, we want to go in the negative direction. If the slope is negative, we want to go in the positive direction. Isn't it? Yeah. And if the slope is zero, we want to just stay put. Isn't it? At this point, do we want to go anywhere if we reach this point where the slope is zero? No. No. If slope is zero, so let's write that condition down at go nowhere. We are already home, right? We are already home. So observe, so one of the things you can do is you can say that at any given point, to make, to minimize a function, go the next value of x should be, or let me put it this way, the next value of x that is, should be the previous value of x. In this case, you want to move in the positive direction, right? But the slope is negative. Suppose I did this dy dx and the slope can be a big value. I multiplied by a small number, a small step. I take a small step against the slope. The slope is negative. I want to move in the positive direction at, at uh, A. Remember, once again, uh, this is A. This is C. At A, slope is negative dy dx is less than zero, dy dx is greater than zero, just to remind you. So at A, what do you want to do? If you take a, if you multiply the slope by a negative number, negative of a negative is a positive number, isn't it guys? Yeah. <clears throat> and so you're taking a step in the right direction. Would you say that the next value of x, x next will be somewhere here. This will be your b. Larger than zero. Right it will be where you want to be. So uh, this is it. At, now let's look at this. At C, what do you want to do? Slope is positive. Once again, your next value of X should be a hop back. Here you want to hop, actually, let me make this hops more visible. Use another color. You want to move in this direction. Here you want to move in this direction. Isn't it? So you want to do, at C, what do you want to do? You, slope is positive. Once again, you want to go against the slope, the dy dx. 
Does this make sense, guys? If you take a little step like this, and alpha you can take as a very small amount, like 0 0.01, you take a tiny step, it's a tiny step in the right direction. And you can keep making those tiny steps till you reach home. Right? Yeah. Is your x still there? So to go towards x till there. To go here also towards x till there. Is this all? I, uh, I think Asif, for your point C, you are missing an equal and x there, I believe. Oh, right, right, right. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Uh -huh. I, I forgot to write that. You're right. Um, thank you for pointing that. Huh? Mm -hmm. So minus the previous value of x minus the negative of the slope, because here the slope was positive. Yep. Negative. And here the slope is positive. Right? And so you realize that irrespective of where you are, on the uh, increasing or decreasing slope, the general rule rule to take a small step towards home, towards x till day, home is that x, the next, your next value of x should be the previous value of x minus some small number, some small fraction of the dy dx, right? This is it. Do you see this, guys? This, I hope this is uh, this intuition is uh, clear to you from this. I'll recap. For any function, if you go against the slope, you're going towards the minima, right? So the rule is, I'll write it down. Uh, in other words, if you are going against the slope, you are going towards the... It's just many ways of saying the same thing. So now let's generalize it to higher dimensions. Suppose y is a function of is a function of x1, x2, xn. How do we generalize? Now there is no notion of dy dx because the question is what is x? X is a vector now, right? And so it turns out that what you can do is you can say that suppose I have a surface like this, I can make a small step like at any given point, I can either move a little bit in delta x1 direction or delta x2 direction. Let's say, okay, like, let me make it x1, x2, then I'll give the, I should reverse the order, delta x2, x1. Are we together, guys? I can see how this function fx varies as I move in this direction or this direction, right? So you can say we can look at the change in y as we move a, a step along one of the axis, variable axis, isn't it? All you can do is take a small step in this direction or this direction. Each one of them will produce its derivatives. The partial, the, the slope specifically along each axis, keeping other, not moving, not changing along other axis, that's an important criteria, not changing x value along other axis 
is called, uh, it's a partial slope, right? It's sort of a partial. partial it's just a slope. If, if I just change x1, right? So how much it changes, the value changes, but partial derivative. Yeah, partial derivative. Derivative. This is what a partial derivative is. And the way we write it is, you'll see me use this notation. Um, dy dx i right or a df x vector along this particular direction you'll see these two notations often used here notation so then comes a very interesting question suppose i make a change from the unit vector x to x plus delta x means if i make small changes along all of these if you make uh, along each of these values, uh, then what happens? How much change do I get, right? It is worth asking, what is the, what is the value of the function x plus delta x? And uh, that value actually can be represented, right? By uh, saying that it is actually just as in the case, okay, so let me, uh, before I go there, let me bring up a concept. So if you put all of these, let's say that there are two axes, x1, x2, right? And you're looking at y as a function of this. So you will have dy, a D, uh, dy, let me just write it as dy, dx1, dy, dx2. Both of these you can write. Isn't it? So there are two components here. If you treat these two components, now here's a magical thing you can do and you'll see why. If you can treat these as components of a vector, see X is a vector, X is equal to X1, I plus X2, J. This is how you write the a vector, yeah. isn't it guys? The, the standard notation. And yeah. it is also, we will, but in machine learning, you don't tend to write i, j, k, you tend to write x1, x2, a column vector. A column vector. Vectors are written in machine learning as column vector. And it is absolutely equivalent to the same thing. It's just a different language in which we write it. So x is a vector. Now we notice that when you take partial derivatives, you can take partial derivatives with respect to each of the x's. So we can therefore ask, what is, the, what is this vector? What is this? x1 dy dx2. What is this column vector, which is the same as dy dx1 i plus dy dx2 j? What is this? It turns out that this is a very useful thing. It is called, it is very, instead of just like you can have uh, a slope, it is the generalization of the concept of slope. It is this notation, nabla, or the grad. It is also called the grad or the gradient. These words are all used. Nabla is the Greek letter. So it's the nabla of a y. It's called the gradient of y. And more generally, people can just write it as an operator, as an, as an abstract operator. You say, this is just this. It is an operator that is waiting to eat something. One, d d x2. Do you notice that this is very funny, uh, a partial derivative of what, right? You haven't specified that. But so if you put y here, it will become this, right? Uh, this is, and so this is uh, equal to, by definition, this is the partial, this is called the gradient of y. Now, we, we realize that in ordinary differential equations, the y uh, plus y plus delta y was equal to basically 
x plus, you know, it, it was basically delta x. Function of the right. delta. So uh, I wouldn't actually, let me not go into the calculus, just take it as a fact of life. Delta y in single dimension in 1D variable, one variable is a dy or dx times small change in x. The small change in y is the slope times the small change in x, right? Mm -hmm. Which is sort of a, a intuition is, and it's very obvious here, that you are here. If you make a small step forward, the decrease is proportional to how big a step you made and how steep the slope is, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that's the idea, how much you lost in height or gained in height is proportional to that. So this is it, it's generalization. It's the change in Y in, the, in a vector notation as a vector, let us say that, uh, sorry, the change in, sorry, in a, in a Y, when x is a vector is actually gradient of y dot product with small change in x because now the change in x could be is a vector right uh, you 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 go you go from this point to this point right this is the x vector x1 x2 and you made a small change delta x right? and so it is given by this equation small changes in this. Now, what does it mean? Let us study this gradient and we'll be practically done with the, uh, so this is just the mathematical background to understand regularization. Uh, what, what does, if gradient is a vector, do you realize that gradient is a vector? Then where does it point? Vectors point in some direction, isn't it? So let us study that. Consider a circle. If you have a circle, let's take an arbitrary point. This point is a P is X, Y, right? From the origin, the line that connects to this is the P vector. Yeah. Is that obvious? So now, what is the equation of this uh, point y, right? Uh, at this particular point, do you realize that the equation of this function is fx? Actually, let me use the notation of x1, x2. Yeah. The, not use uh, y, x2. I can write it as x1 square plus x2 square. Right, and the circle is, circle is fx1, x2 is equal to some constant r squared. Would you agree? Yeah. It is just a constant, what you call a contour line of this function, this. Now let us find the gradient of this function and see what it comes out to be. Gradient of this function is equal to partial of this function with respect to x1, partial of this function with respect to x2. Now, look at this. If I take a partial derivative, means x2 doesn't change. What is the derivative of x1? 2x1. Well, 2x1. And the derivative of, uh, with, with respect to x2 is 2x2. Mm -hmm. And you observe something very interesting for a circle. And this happens to be just pointing in the direction of twice just the p vector, isn't it? Yes. P is your uh, p vector is given by x1, x2. Are we together? Right. So what does it mean? Where does the gradient point? Gradient is just a vector that points. This is gradient of fx1, x2. Isn't it, guys? 
so far so good guys now there is an interesting lesson if i look at lots of circles of different uh, these are all the functions have different constant values so you would agree that along the circles the function has to be constant right those are constant value surfaces or constant value curves for the function what is the gradient point relative to those circles what is the direction of the gradient is it parallel to it is it inclined to it or is it perpendicular to it perpendicular it's perpendicular it's so we we notice the fact we notice that let me write it in a different color so that this is emphasized or maybe i'll use the same thing observe the grad f let me write it as x vector is perpendicular to perpendicular to this is the symbol for perpendicular to the constant curves these are called contours right to the constant curves i.e. the circles is some constant r squared right for some r isn't it guys this observation is very general the point is what is true for the circle is always true this is a general fact gradient of f is perpendicular to contours of f fx for any and every function this is a very general fact i i used the example of a circle to illustrate it but actually this is a very general fact it's a it's a thing you need to remember in mind well that's a long detour so what where are we going with all this math that's wh why all these mathematical preliminaries so here is where it is coming from so let's go back to our energy surfaces our, our uh, sort of error surface rather error surface this was a beta not beta 1 these were our these were our this thing so here do you notice that you had these contour surfaces right also observe something where does the gradient point the direction of the first of all it is perpendicular to the constant surfaces but is it pointing in the direction of increasing f value or decreasing f value does the value of f increase along as you go in the direction like what, what does the radius increase as you go outwards in the direction of the gradient or decrease increases increases isn't it in fact it increases the most um perpendicular to the gradient is of course the flat the constant surfaces so the second observation is is perpendicular to the and every f and points to the direction of maximum increase of f x at that point it's a very general observation the gradient gradient points to the direction of maximum increase so you want to increase a function follow the gradient if you want to decrease a function um then you then go against the gradient because that will be the fastest way to decrease a function gradient descent gradient descent and therefore when in our case what do we want to do we want to decrease the error the error so we go against the 
gradient, right? In other words, if you are at any given beta value here, let us say that this is some arbitrary P given by beta naught, beta one. What is it? What do we want to do? What, and this is the perfect a beta naught tilde, a beta one tilde. You want to go here. What is the way to go there? What do you do? You will say beta naught's next value should be equal to the previous value of beta minus alpha times. Yeah. yeah. So in, in vector notation, yeah. you can go, if you write just beta uh, minus the gradient of the error function, right? This is the equation, the celebrated equation of a gradient descent that is essentially the heart of machine learning. The learning of machine learning often amounts to the gradient descent towards the minima. That is why I took some time to explain this concept because it is not just a concept in machine learning. It is one of the concepts central to this field. Right? It's the gradient. So if you break it out into components, you could say that a beta one or beta zero, next zero, next is equal to previous value of beta zero minus a D E D a beta zero, a beta one next is equal to beta one minus alpha D E the beta one, right? And so forth. You can keep going down to other values of beta n. Let's just suppose you have beta n next is equal to beta n minus, suppose you have n dimensional space, parameter space, the beta n, right? Uh, it's just a general, it's just this thing rewritten in simpler, uh, broken it out into components. This is your gradient descent. This is how you solve the problem. Now, Let's come back to the machine learning part of it, right? This was a detour through calculus, basic calculus, right? We took the detour. Now what happens is, and if, if it, I'll mention this without giving a reason why, when you take high degree polynomials and when you have overfitting, when you take large N for poly regression, regression, you will, you will, what will you end up with? You will have beta zero, beta one, beta n, isn't it guys? You will have different parameters, beta naught, beta one, this thing. What you observe, they tend to get very loud or large. Right? So what will suddenly happen is your beta naughts, no? good values of beta naught will be let's say two minus one or something like that. But these values, they will suddenly start looking like minus one, five, seven, nine, six, three, right? This will look like plus 168, two, one, four, two. Do you notice that these values of beta, they blow up, the values blow up. So every factor seems to matter a lot. Each of the parameters seems to matter a lot. It seems to become very loud, you know, very large values. Geometrically, and, and I wouldn't give a proof of this, but just take it as a fact that this happens. So what does it mean in real terms? It means that if you look at the error surface, this error surface, right, it just runs away. The minima here is very far from the origin runs away from the origin. That's the problem. And that is what causes, this causes oscillations. This causes the oscillations we observed. Uh, we observed for large n, right? Overfitting is there, high variance are terms. So what does it mean? Uh, if you go and look at this curve, let's go and look at this. 
wherever we are. Yeah, let's go back at this picture. What you will notice is that for the blue line, the betas are reasonably small, beta naught, beta one. Uh, for the, uh, for the uh, where is this parabolic curve? For the red line, you'll have beta naught, beta one, beta two. They will be also reasonably small. For the yellow line, three beta, four betas, beta naught, beta one, beta two, beta three. They'll be a little bit pronounced, but still reasonable. But by the time you get to green lines, your parameter values are big. And by the time you go to the pink line, your betas are really big. Are you getting that, guys? Right? They become really big, and that is what is causing oscillation. One is pulling it in positive direction, the y value. One is pulling it in a very negative uh, direction. Uh, here, let's uh, do it there. Right. So if you have very large values, you can realize with the positive and negative signs, they are all pulling the y value in different directions, positive and negative. So you start seeing a lot of oscillations in the function. So what do we do to cure it? You basically say that we are not going to take a, the absolute minima that is here, you know, of this function. Let me draw it out again. So what do we what do we do? How do we solve this? So guys, I'll continue on for another half an hour. I want to finish this topic. It's an important topic. Um, what happens is that if you look at this bowl, and our origin is here. Sorry, let me draw it here. Let us say that our origin is here. So you notice that this has run away here, very far off, right? Uh, beta naught, beta one, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Imagine that there are lots of betas. This is your error surface, right? So here are the contour lines. What you can do is you can say regularization says that. We don't want the absolute minima. Uh, we are happy so long as we go a limited amount from the origin. Let us say that you set a, a limit radius r and you say that around the origin, I will go only radius r, but no more than that. So whatever is the, mini whatever is the minimum value of error lifted out from here, wherever it meets the error surface, whatever error is there within this disk, within this space is what I will consider. Huh? Let me uh, draw it out in two dimensions. In 2D, in the contour view, what you have is this. And again, I'll just draw it as yes. beta naught, one. A beta one. You're saying that I have a certain radius of a budget R, right? And I am not willing to go or find a solution above it. But the real solution is here, very far away. And it has its contour lines like this. So, and then more contour lines go here. More contour, like more contour lines go here. So you notice that inside the disk, let me mark the disk as this. Uh, let me mark it with big fat strokes. Oops, that didn't quite do it. Yeah. Let me take this. This is your, this is where you want to be. Right. Uh, I, I'll, there's one intuition I can give. Uh, you know, in India, we have the story of the Ramayana. And there is a scene in the Ramayana, the Panchwati, uh, in which, uh, the, the, so the story goes that two brothers, one is a king named Ram, and uh, he has a brother named Lakshman, and they're very, very close, of course. And Ram's wife is Sita. And now they are the good guys. And there is a demon called uh, uh, Ravan, who is always on the watch to grab or cause mischief. So 
Ram and uh, Lakshman, the two uh, good guys, they have to go out during the day. They're in the forest. They're in exile in the forest. And uh, they're supposed to go out and uh, hunt for food, find food, uh, look around for food. So while they do it, uh, Sita is uh, alone at uh, home. And uh, there's all sorts of danger. So what uh, Lakshman does, the brother does, is uh, he draws around the house a circle. Right? And that is our circle here. You draw a circle. This circle is your, uh, is your limit. And you just say that so long as you stay within the circle, you're safe. It's an enchanted circle. No demon and no bad uh, influence can find its way here. Uh, find its way uh, into this circle. Right? can come into the blue area. Think of it like that. Uh, in terms of uh, our regularization, what it means is that you don't go out of the circle because you know that if the values of beta blow up, you will have overfitting. So you set a budget. You say that you no know, betas, all the betas must, the sum total of all the betas, the magnitude must be within this point, right? So you could pick any point here but it cannot be more than a radius. Um, let me just put this here, uh, the radius. This is the origin. It cannot be more than a certain distance r from, the, from that. So now the question is, you realize that above it are the, is the error surface rising. You realize that this is the point of minimum error. This is your beta tilde here. This is this contour line represents. If you think about this, uh, be, below this are these contour lines, right? They are they are mapping to these contour lines. So what happens? Every concentric circle that is the the further you are in this uh, concentric contour lines, does the error increase or decrease? They represent surfaces of greater or lesser lesser error. This is the point of least error. This will have. This will be this error surface. Increase. 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 But what you are saying is, so what is the point of the least error inside your circle? So let me call this surface E A. This surface is E B. This surface is E C. This surface is E D. So which of these, if you want to find within your circle? a point which has the least error, which would be, would you, would you agree that EA, all the error, so EA constant error surfaces, EA is less than EB, is less than EC, is less than ED? Yeah. Right? Yes. That is clear. So now I ask you this question. What is the point of least error, not absolutely least error, which is here in beta, beta tilde, but the least error within this, uh, enchanted circle. Yeah. EB. Just at this point, isn't it? Let me yeah. mark this point as some point. Uh, this, uh, this point, isn't it? This is my, this is the best I can do. Within the enchanted desk. We agree with this, right? Now let's think about this. At this point, see, this is a circle. We just realized that in a circle, where does the gradient of the circle point? So uh, the circle is given by F uh, beta, beta naught, beta one is equal to beta naught square plus beta one square. And we can generalize. This is the equation of the circle. Does it make sense, guys? Uh, we are in the parameter space. So here the axes are not x1, y1, but beta naught, beta one. So this is the equation of the circle, isn't it, guys? This, is, this makes sense, isn't it? And the circle is just is equal to some constant, r squared. Oops, sorry, r squared. Yeah. So far, so good, right? So now, what is the gradient of the circle? Gradient of f is equal to whatever. You can just say, uh, to 
beta naught mm -hmm. to beta one. So two times this. It would be at this point, which is where would the gradient of this point? Uh, it would point from in the, the origin to increase, and it would point here. Gradient of the the constraint is this, right? Constraint yeah. surface beta is this. Now, what about this uh, error surface? You see that the error surface EA, let me go to the white color now. The EA, this error surface, this is a contour line of the error surface yeah. right? point. Yeah. Right? Where would the gradient of that point, which is the direction of maximum increase of error? Let me the opposite, use color. opposite direction. Opposite direction, isn't it? Let me use a color that would be visible in this. So I've used maybe green. Green might serve a purpose. Let's say green. Yes, let's take this. So I'll just make it like this. So the this would be the gradient of the error surface. Would you agree? Yes. The gradient would point like this. And so you observe something that you be observe that gradient of f and gradient of e point in opposite opposite did i spell it right opposite directions opposite directions right and so we can write gradient of f is equal to minus the gradient of e but we don't know what the magnitude is so we'll put a lambda parameter here right so far so good guys the gradient of the constraint surface and the gradient of the error functions they point opposite to each other then there must be with an up to a negative sign and a proportionality constant this must be the equation this is how you write two things which two vectors which point in opposite directions up to a proportionality constant they should look like this yeah that's right so it turns out that what is what i just showed you is not just true of uh, just error functions it's true of any function and any constraint here i made the constraint into a circle you could take any constraint surf, uh, 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 surface right and you could take any function the point the optimal point where these two things these two surfaces touch just like this you know they glancingly touch tangentially touch and represents a point of the best you can do is always given by this equation. And it was discovered by the great mathematician, Lagrange. Lagrange. I hope I didn't massacre. Is it Lagrange or Lagrange? Um, could, could one of you please verify? I think it's Lagrange. Oh, no, it's not. It is just L apostrophe Grange. Oh, goodness. I should know this. Could one of you please verify and tell me which is the correct one? So it is the Lagrangian. You, you say this is the Lagrangian multiplier. Maybe it's Lagrange, Lagrangian. Multiplier. And what- L-A-G-R-A-N-G-I-A-N, Lagrangian multiplier. Yeah. yeah, so the name is Lagrange, isn't it? The person Lagrange. Yes. The mathematician, Lagrange. So you typically pronounce it as Lagrange Mathematic, or at least I do. I don't know if that is correctly. The the mathematician. He was a great mathematician. He discovered not just this. His work is prolific in in calculus and analytical uh, geometry and analytical uh, analysis. So this is actually what I did is using the example of our error surfaces and constraint and regularization. Actually, I took you guys to the discovery process of a fundamental result in calculus. This is in fact, constraint optimization. This is it. 
optimization. And so what you can say is this is constraint optimization. And when you do it, when you apply the disk, a, a budget, a unit circle. So what, so let us summarize. Summarize, my spelling is getting more atrocious. Summarize with unit circle as constraint, right? As constraint, right? You get error. We can find the constraint. We can find the minimum error within the circle within the circle, right? That is the solution we will take. So let's ex explore this a little bit more. There's some very interesting consequences with this. So we have constrained E, this is equal to minus, okay. Uh, I think, I don't know which way I put the lambda. I put the lambda on the E. Let me do it the other way around actually, because that is much more conventional. Uh, let me put, it doesn't matter, right? If we are just defining the lambda, so who cares? Um, lambda multiplier. Typically, you put the lambda on the, the proportionality constant here. right? So I'll put it here. This is more traditional. Right? Uh, are we together? You put the proportionality constant on the constraint surface, not on the, the main function. So it is here. It is like this, uh, lambda. And it is, by the way, just convention, nothing, nothing more. Uh, this is it. Now let us rewrite this equation. What we are basically saying is E a beta plus lambda F beta. Gradient of this is zero. This is what we are trying to find, isn't it? I just rewrote this equation. There's, yes. there's. And from this, we conclude that in other words, we are minimizing e beta plus lambda f beta, this, right? The, the, what you call it, see error function we were minimizing before. Now we are minimizing a different function. This is called the loss function in machine learning. And now you got introduced to your first loss function, which is not your sum squared error. Actually we did, uh, we, there was another one uh, in logistic. Did I do the MLE derivation? Otherwise in mathematical uh, methods, we'll of course do that function, loss function. This is called the loss function. The word loss function is, Pretty, very, it's pretty pervasive in machine learning. And so today you got introduced to the loss function of this problem. This is the loss function. So let us work it out. What does it become? This is what you try to minimize. So in other words, now you say solution, the optimal point, point is where, is where, point beta, let, let me just say, oh, this is, uh, forgive me, the point beta tilde is where keeps By the way, do you notice that I'm using a very scripted L, right? I'm not just writing it like L beta. So it is much more common to use the scalligraphic L for the loss function, right? Mathematicians tend to use the calligraphic L. If you use just ordinary L, that too is used, but a more common is to see this calligraphic L used for the loss function. Loss function is one of the most important constructs in machine learning. Uh, you can say that machine learning walks on two legs. You, first, I told you that you quantize the error and then you decrease the error. Now I'm extending it a little bit more and saying it's not just the error, it is a loss function. The, the, uh, in any given problem in machine learning, you first write a loss function. Once you have written a loss function, then you can do gradient descent on the loss function to find the minima, right? So use gradient descent. To find beta tilde, beta tilde is arc min beta for the loss function. 
right? For this, it is that value of the beta that will minimize the loss function. Are we together? And this is the this is a core result. This was where the long journey was coming to. This result is not just true of the topic at hand. It is generally true in a wide variety of situations in machine learning, as we will realize. Huh? We just did constraint optimization. Now let's look at it. Remember that I told you many Minkowski norms, different. Now recall the various distance. Do you remember that from the last discussion that we did? That there are many different ways of defining distance, the unit circle. Uh, I will go back to the top. The Manhattan distance equilibrium. Yeah, that's right. I, I will uh, remind you that we did this. Uh, is Did I do it in this one? Or I did it, yeah, this uh, one. Yeah, L1, did. L2, yeah. L1, L2 norms, etc. So this is it. Yeah, L1, N2 no norms. Yeah, we were talking about this distance notation of norms. So we will go back to that and ask this question. I'll just re recap what we learned there. So you, do you guys see that, you know, all these ideas tied together in machine learning, right? You may say, wow, it's such a vast space of theoretical constructs, but uh, you would be pleasantly surprised to know that pretty much if you got here, as far as practical machine learning is con concerned, this is all the concepts you really need, right? A loss function gradient and its gradient descent, that's all. That's all you really need in machine learning to a large extent, huh? uh, we'll come to that. So what are the Minkowski norms? If you remember the Minkowski norm of uh, two points was X prime was equal to X i, uh, x1 minus x1 prime to the power L plus x2 minus x2 prime to the power L. This, the whole to the power one, mm -hmm. right? Now, now comes the surprising thing. Look at this little disk that we made in the Lakshman Rekha that we drew here, the yellow line. This is a unit circle, isn't it? Yeah. What is the definition of a unit circle? What is the function definition? For n is for l is equal to two, two. Yep. the fx one. Uh, so now let me write it in the language of beta because we are in the parameter space. Beta beta naught beta one would be beta naught square plus beta one square, isn't it? So the constant values of this function were the circles. What is the gradient of this? So well, mm, forget beta plus beta one. you already did that before. So this is it. Do you notice that? And what was error uh, the, in this thing, in the loss function, if you remember the loss function was, was equal to the error function of the beta plus lambda f a beta. And mm. let us replace it with what they really were. The error beta was actually equal to uh, going back to the old uh, story of where we started from. It is y minus yi minus yi hat square. Remember, y hat beta naught plus beta one xi yeah. square plus lambda. Now, what is fx? Beta naught square plus beta mm. one mm. square plus this, right? And well, this is the e equation that people write in books, though I would, I would highly recommend that you think in terms of the way uh, I taught you as a constraint surface between an error that you want to minimize given a certain constraint. This is the constraint. And now, now your book essentially writes this equation without, and there is a pic pictorial explanation for it. So this is what they're trying to say. Right? I've given you a much more detailed uh, picture of this. And you write therefore L beta is equal to sum over all the uh, data terms of yi, yi minus yi hat square plus lambda sum over beta i square. Uh, this is beta j, right? Uh, 
uh, beta j wings j is equal to one j is equal to whatever number of dimension there is n dimensions uh, right uh, sorry whatever degree of polynomial you are taking beta naught beta one beta two beta three whatever j is equal to zero does this look like it so when you use at n is equal to two this is called the ridge regularization regularization but uh, then you you say all right that is fine but what happens if i take l is equal to 1 right then the l is equal to 1 minkowski norm means what remember what does it do to your uh, a constrained surface now uh, it became a diamond yes mm -hmm. i'm sir diamond right That's it. diamond it becomes a diamond so let me go back and color this diamond uh, big bold strokes um, okay i think i'll have to write it so now uh, the in this world it is still remember this is a circle it's a unit circle isn't it, it looks like a diamond but because of the l1 norm it, this is how a circle would look all points on the boundary are unit distance from this origin if your distance if you define your distance by the uh, l1 norm okay, this is uh, where we go and uh, this is your thing let's go back and draw our um, uh, the contour lines contour lines so you notice something very interesting begins oh sorry this is uh, this sucks uh, um okay let me not even bother going there where do they seem to touch corner on the axis touch on the axis this is something very interesting this uh, this is the x1 axis and this is the x2 axis what happens is uh, more often than not this pointy edge notice how the pointy edge of the diamond pricks the error surface error contour surface isn't it this is your uh, point that you're looking at it's it's no surprise actually that very very often because it's sticking out if you have your you know imagine walking into the bar and you have your elbows like this have you ever tried doing that imagine walking into a crowded bar and you have your elbows like this what will happen you'll make friends not yeah yes exactly you will hit a lot of people and annoy the maximum number of people that you can so uh, that is it so these are the elbows sticking out so it is much more likely to hit the contour surfaces the contours of the error the error you know contour surfaces of the error uh, in this in this space in this plane and so what it means is now what happens when it hits it what is the value so by the way this is not x1 x2 i apologize remember we are in the parameter space this is beta not beta 1 uh, right uh, beta 1 in this space so what does it mean at this point what is beta 1 at this uh, it is 1 0 right yes exactly so what will happen is at the optimal point beta not will be will be some value right and beta 1 that will be beta not till day and beta 1 will be will will vanish perfect value of beta 1 will be zero do you see this guys this point is beta not tilde and zero so what does it mean in terms of our equation what it means is that y as a function 
plus a beta one X, what happened? This term just disappeared, right? Means X doesn't matter in effect. So now the way it really works is not like this. The way it works is, uh, let me just call it, uh, deliberately I'll cheat. Uh, let me go to N dimensions. It's a polynomial of N dimension, right? So the N dimensional space. So beta naught plus beta one, let me just say beta nth dimension, right? Uh, beta one X plus beta two X square, uh, sorry, X square, uh, X, X to the power N. What will happen is when you hit it along this axis, a lot of the betas will start disappearing, right? So what will happen is out of the betas that you have, beta one, beta two, beta three, beta N, beta I, let me call it beta J, beta N. What will happen is, because the you punctured the uh, the contour along this, some of these, right, betas may start disappearing, and your problem, therefore, reduces to a lesser number of terms in the equation. Do you see that, guys? And so, what will happen is, your um, model will be simpler. Not only that, you have done mortality reduction as a side effect. you have done dimensionality. In what sense? You said that all of these higher order terms mattered. They don't matter, right? Reduction. And now let's generalize it to many variables. Let us say that you write y this. Suppose you write y as a function of beta naught plus beta one x one plus beta two x two. You know, this is really a different feature. Yeah. This particular regression, the L1 norm will start destroying some of these features, right? So you will get, it will say that those features don't matter. You can get rid of it. What does it mean? You have reduced those features, removed those features from your feature space. Therefore, you have reduced the dimensionality of the problem, right? This is actually one of the great benefits of L1 uh, norm. There is a name for this. It is called the lasso regularization. It's surprising that it is actually, well, ridge regression was discovered a long time ago. Lasso was discovered somewhat more recently. And the authors of your textbook, actually, they have done considerable amount of work with the lasso. They even have a book on lasso regression. Is just L is equal to one norm. And so your beta function is, uh, this is y minus y hat square summed over i. But what is your function now? Plus lambda, remember? What is your function? Yes. This is equal to the unit circle is defined as a beta naught absolute value plus beta one absolute value plus beta two absolute value, so on and so forth, right? So I can write this as L beta hat is equal to sum over I, Y I minus Y I hat square plus lambda summation over beta J absolute value j is equal to zero to j is equal to suppose n dimensions, right? Whatever number of dimensions that you take, it will be this. And so when you minimize, this is the loss function for lasso. This is your loss function. See guys, this these things are given in books. Typically it writes the equation and quite often you don't know where the equations are coming from. So I went through the derivation. Now, why did I go through this long uh, mathematical derivation? Loss functions are at the heart of machine learning. And quite often loss functions have constraint terms and so forth. So I thought that if today I introduce you to how people create loss functions, how they reason about it, how they think of, and uh, find ways to improving the model or regularizing it or doing things, you have gotten to one of the key activities researchers do in machine learning. 
everything. So loss function for last cell. And this is, I promise you, the most technical we'll ever be in our machine learning workshops. But do this much level, do please try to understand because you need this much. Uh, if you really want to be good in this field, you should know the foundations. And it, this is, these are the foundations, right? So you should know that. And by the way, all of these things we will review again when we do the math of machine learning, right? Here I'm more focused on the regularization aspect of it. So this is the loss function and it has a, a beautiful effect. What happens is that uh, there is this regularization parameter, you know, this lambda. What, what lambda does is as you increase lambda, the value of the different betas, they, they begin to go to the, let's say that they start with certain values they go sort of, they go across, right? Or uh, let's say that you normalize, actually, let me take a more normalized view of it. Let's say that they all started some normalized value at the origin, uh, this betas. So what will happen is some will fall to zero here, some will fall to zero and uh, some will, uh, lot of them will fall here, some will go here. So suppose you take a cutoff of beta here, uh, this point. Suppose you take this as a cutoff. So what will happen? At this cutoff, these values, these betas will disappear, right? These betas, these, these, these features, uh, will uh, be, because this, each beta is associated with a feature, these features will disappear. Why will they disappear? Because their coefficients, their parameters have all gone to zero at this value of the lambda. So what you do is you choose your lambda wisely so that a few at this moment, uh, this particular beta is alive, this is alive and this is alive, but these ones have all gone to zero. So you, you do dimensionality reduction by sliding lambda back and forth, right? Sliding uh, the lambda back and forth and you get certain feature reductions. Go ahead. As if in this, in this graph, you're assuming that, you know, all the betas are kind of in the beginning when the lambda is zero, the same, break. but I, ideally they will be different, but still the effect will be same. No, no, whatever their values are, yeah, it, they'll be different. One way to normalize is divide everything by its Oh, okay. okay, normalized values, okay. <laughs> Just normalize it to one and then see. Oh, okay. But in reality, see, I drew that more complicated picture, but yeah, let's yeah. go with this. Huh? So this is what happens, you, you have dimensionality reduction. So we learned two methods, L2, which is more common is the ridge, it's called the ridge regression, DGE, ridge regression, ridge regression been practiced for many years. Here, the constraint surface is, is sum over beta i square. L1 lasso regression, if you want to use this, f beta is equal to sum over the absolute value of i, you know? Remember Manhattan distance, unit circle of Manhattan distance of this. So this is it. And it's quite interesting that if you understand Minkowski norm, you understand both of these ways of regularization so easily. Not only that, you can cook up more, uh, more regularization methods of your own. For example, why not try this? Why not try L3? I mean, you can do whatever you want, basically. Now, one of the questions that arises is which is better? They both have the advantages and disadvantages. Lasso has one advantage that uh, certain features just disappear. You have dimensionality reduction. Ridge will never make the features disappear. It will just make it very small because it's circular. So all the feature, all the betas will have some more or less non-zero value. The ones that really matter will have bigger values. The ones that don't matter will have smaller values, but they won't disappear. So that is one of the downsides of the rich people say, but you don't get the dimensionality reduction benefit. But the problem with lasso is that it over suppresses, right? It, it is too pointy. Sometimes it gets rid of too many features, right? And so what people do is between L1 and L2, again, you have to try and see which gives you the best cross-validation error. Uh, 
There is also elastic net. What does it do? It basically says, put get a loss function with both L1 and L2, right? So then you end up with two lambdas, right? One lambda one associated with lasso, one lambda two associated with ridge. And so you try to optimize this. Now you have two hyperparameters to search for. So elastic net is a very obvious extension. It says in the loss function, go add both the terms, both the uh, Minkowski L, L is equal to one term and the L is equal to two term that becomes elastic net. So guys, this weekend uh, on Saturday, we will do a lab in which we'll see the effect of all of this regularization. So guys today, you know, I developed or uh, recapitulated a lot of math. We, we took a lot of time recapitulating uh, the math, which we have done in the past, uh, but we needed it today to understand the regularization. But once you understand regularization, let me summarize. Uh, higher degree polynomials without regularization, they tend to oscillate, right, data. You can suppress it with more data, which is the best way if you can, but quite often you can't have enough data. Data is, rather an expensive commodity. So you have another technique of constraint optimization, right? And again, as I said, uh, in very, very complex models like deep neural networks, mm -hmm. it is a given that the parameter space is vast, hundreds of millions of parameters. And even if you have hundreds of millions of data, it's still not sufficient. So you need regularization. You need the technology of regularization and constraint optimization. So that is given by putting a disk around it. So we talked, we went through the whole explanation of what is gradient descent. Some of you asked for it. So I did the recap of that. Right? So at any given point, the function achieves a minima. You go in the direction of the minima if you um, take walk against the gradient, right? And we saw that in both in one dimension effects and in multiple dimensions gradient points opposite to the, gradient is the direction of maximum increase. So if you want to quickly decrease, you go against the gradient. If you are in Mount Diablo, the last thing you want to do is go against the gradient. What will happen if you go against the gradient? Increase that. You'll tumble down the hill. Yeah. Isn't it? Because gradient is the steepest path, right? Up the hill. You don't want to go the steepest path downhill because the steepest path downhill probably means you're falling down. Okay, so this is it. This is what we are saying that the, this, uh, at, in, in a, when you have a constrained region and you say, give me the minima here, then at that point, the minimal point, optimal point, the gradient of the constrained surface and the gradient of the actual error function will be um, opposites so in other words, you can write it in this way, error is the, up to a proportionality constant and a negative of the other one. And that is essentially the equation of Lagrange multipliers. This is called uh, Lagrange multiplier. At some point in calculus, you must have learned this many, many years ago in your calculus. Class. Anybody remembers learning this in calculus? So, but if not, then well, today you learn something very important. It's constraint optimization thing. And so regularization is as simple as saying, what if my constraint surface are the Minkowski norms, you know, unit circles with different Minkowski norms. That's it. All of regularization can be asked in one simple statement. What if I apply a constraint surface, constraint in the unit circle constraint in the parameter space, in the hypothesis space, that the, the values of the parameter must be within the unit circle? The moment you do that, both of the regularization come together, come like this. So in other words, if you were truly a, a very, very skilled mathematician who knew all of this theory very well, and the way to explain regularization to that person would be, oh, it's constraint optimization uh, in the hypothesis space of the error function. The constraint is the unit circle with different norms. That's it. Right? So that gives you your lasso and your ridge. 
regression. So that's what I meant. Uh, that's a summary of what I am saying here. Elastic net is the hybridization of the two. So I would like to stop here. By the way, I, I would like to stop at a very happy note. Um, uh, not many of you are here, but obviously the ones have persisted here. Uh, good, it's been a long session. Uh, one of our uh, people here in this uh, talk, in the session, uh, Pradeep Devedi, he has just gotten admitted to one of the most prestigious uh, computer science graduate schools, uh, University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. At this moment, it is ranked in the top three. It is ranked, I believe. Depends upon which ranking you go to. US ranking says it's number two in the country and US News says it's number fifth in the country at par with Carnegie Mellon, MIT, Stanford, Berkeley. And this has always been amongst the top universities. And so uh, Pradeep, who has been doing all our workshops, he's here actually uh, in this talk. Uh, if you get a chance to congratulate him, he just got admission to the graduate school at UIUC Urbana-Champaign. Hey, congratulations, Pradeep. Congratulations, Pradeep. Congratulations, Pradeep. Pradeep. All congratulations. Kudos. Thank you. All right, guys, i the recording. And uh, if you have a, a moment, if you guys want to stay for any questions, you're welcome to. Let me stop the recording. Uh, because of might not be related. So in the decision tree, we do have uh, like the length of the nodes uh, as a uh, yes, say, a controlling vector. Yes, yes, yes. Is, is it uh, some, something falling between Reg and Lasso or it's different? No, no, it's a completely different loss function. So once you get used to a loss function, that the loss function is not just the sum squared error, uh, for, for example, that you can add extra terms, constraints to it, now you're in the world of constraint optimization. But there the constraint is not so complicated, unit circle. There the constraint is simple. But penalized for the number of nodes, right? Are we together? So the loss function there is, uh, let me write it out. Three. One simple loss, I mean, obviously people do more complicated stuff, but uh, I will just simplify it. The tree loss function would be last function in the case of a tree would be the sum squared error y minus y hat, the usual squared summed over, right? Squared. So um, this plus alpha, some number, some, some uh, this is your modulating factor and the number of nodes in the tree. So you realize that you're penalizing complex you're saying also cut down on the number of nodes in the tree. Uh, nodes. So you have to have a simpler tree. But that is it. You get used to the concept of loss function. So in many, many, many situations, your goal is just to write the loss function for that problem. In fact, you can say that a catalog of algorithms, parametric methods, all, each parametric method and uh, is, or even like this, a tree. Ultimately, you can write a loss function and you have to just go minimize it. Are we together? So oh, yeah. a lot of learning is often, often, learning is essentially minimizing loss function, pick a loss function for that particular algorithm and go minimize it. And diff different algorithms have different loss functions. That's it. Work for classification too, right? Uh, come again? Classification too, right? Yeah, it worked for classification. Yeah. So in fact, I did not do the derivation of the- Logistic regression. Logist did I do the derivation of the logistic regression loss function in ML100 this time or not? You did distance function, but I, I don't think it Maximum did go like to low. estimator and so forth. Anyway, see, this is where the math one comes and it fills in all the gaps. And so we'll do that. It is called the cross entropy loss. Mm -hmm. So uh, for, for uh, similar kind of idea. Yeah. <clears throat> squared error. So regression has some squared 
in a term. That one but, is an entropy loss. You know. Yeah, classification has cross entropy loss. Entropy loss. But then in both the terms, you can add that, that plus the regularization term. term. In fact, regularization is so important that if we, in many, many algorithms, people know that developers forget to do regularization. So these days, the newer algorithms, for example, if you look at the TensorFlow or the, the PyTorch, you will see, if I'm right, uh, the is regularization is the loss function. Okay, when you say cross entropy loss or you say MSE, I'm pretty sure that there is a default loss function that is assumed, which is usually the L2 norm. It ridge regression is pretty much assumed. It is there unless you turn it off. That's the way I remember it. Anyway, when, when we go there, we can uh, refresh our minds on whether this is true or not. So you should always regularize guys, unless you have a lot of lots and lots of data. So now you learned quite a few things. We should clean up the data. We should normalize the data. We should do try dimensionality reduction. And now today we learned one more thing. You should try to regularize your model. Okay. It's important. How many, mm -hmm. how many betas typically are good enough? I mean, or you can't tell. Huh? You can't tell. The data is Data but design. the thing is that just you know, just like kernels makes case somewhat muted, right? It doesn't screw up the model. Uh, when you regularize, even if you took a tenth degree polynomial, and the problem was only three degrees, mm -hmm. it will happen to the other seven parameters. Uh, they will just get muted out or killed, removed. Okay? So you can start with the complex model, and it will just regularization will simplify it. It's not going to introduce biases or. <laughs> See, the thing is, whenever you remove, like depends upon beta. Okay. how aggressively you use the lambda. Mm. If you use it too aggressively, of course, mm. you're using some level of bias because you're, you're over dampening the oscillations. Right. So it is there, the, the, the risk is always there. So, That's it. Yeah, okay. So, so if you pick the lambda and then it over dampens, um, what, what happens during uh, gradient descent? Uh, do, do the features drop out of the equation already? The next they, they, Yeah, they do drop out. But what will happen is it will go and uh, hit the surface and a lot of the betas will be at the pointy edge that will puncture the error surface will be at a point along one of the axes where a lot of the other axes have disappeared. So in the next iteration, they're no longer added in the computation because they've been muted out? Yes, yes, they're gone. So they are okay. gone, right? Uh, you don't have those anyway. So this is, the, this is the concept of regularization, guys. The reason I emphasized and I sort of uh, I preempted the lab is it is more important to do a lab in this. So let's do a lab in this on Saturday. Was it was it clear, guys? It was a long intellectual journey, and perhaps one of the longest intellectual journeys you'll have in machine learning. Very, not many people fully understand the whole theory of it, but it's good to know. I mean, you may say, what is the use of it? And the use is that this is how you understand papers, for example, textbooks, and this is how you understand what you're doing. Otherwise, these are just terms. You see L1, L2 in your parameter, model parameter in code. And you said, okay, L1 is this, L2 is this. Right. So what, what are you setting? You're setting the lambda parameters there, the dampening factors there. It was very clear, Asif. Thank you. I think going against the gradient, that was, that was very interesting. Yeah, and if you remember, this is uh, long ago, in ML100, I must have done this. I remember clearly doing this with you guys. You remember this surface, this sort of drawings? Yeah, I didn't yeah. regularize, yes. but I did gradient descent. Mm -hmm. So this is it, guys, uh, and uh, uh, have fun. I'll see you on Saturday noon. We'll have a long session, we'll have a quiz, and we'll have a lab. Thank you, sir. Bye. Yes.
quiz at noon and the lab will be after? Lab will be right after. Got it. Sonam, could you please hang on for a moment? Are you listening? Yes. Yeah, sure. If you could please hang on. All right, guys. Eh? Good night then. Thank you. Good night. Thank you, Asim. Awesome. Bye. Uh, Sonal, uh, are, are you getting something out of the workshop? The reason I ask is you're the youngest person here. Yeah, it's getting a bit harder now to understand some of the topics. Yeah, yeah this would be a stretch for you. This, this would really be a stretch. Yeah, especially today since I'm not too familiar with calculus yet. Oh, okay. Then just forget that today's session happened. Okay. Because I was a bit lost the entire time. <laughs> so you were really lost with the loss function. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah that's all right. How are you doing? Uh, are you getting anything out of the course? Yeah, I am actually. I'm learning a lot through different ways to manipulate data. So I didn't really know that there is um, these many ways to do this kind of stuff. Um, yeah. yeah, so um like the decision trees and mm -hmm. random forest and support victim machines yeah um i wasn't too familiar with what all those words meant but now it's making more sense about how they can be applied yeah nice which you are in the 10th grade now isn't it yeah just going into 10th going to 11th going to 11th oh yeah you have started very early it's great uh, the earlier you start in this subject, the better. By the way, your major, I thought, was bio. Yeah, but um, I think it can still be applied to bio, too. Yes, so computational biology is actually very, very hot. My daughter is doing research in computer. She is, she is doing computer science, but her research work is in computational bio. The older one? Yes. Oh, that's really cool. I didn't know that. Is looking at some genomic structures and applying a, a deep neural networks to it in college. So now, like uh, biology, see the next 10 years of machine learning or AI will be almost completely devoted to bio and medical. Most of the work will be there. So for people with a medical or bio background, it will become increasingly relevant to learn this stuff. I agree. Oh, yes, Patrick, you're a doctor. Patrick is a doctor here, and uh, he's investigating a lot of data, disease data. Oh. And, and yeah. And I, I echo the sentiments of Sana because uh, like pre med, pre med doesn't really have as much, unless you take computational biology, you don't have as much calculus also. So you do need to take some time. You can, you, if you want, you can look, look through some videos just to get an idea of how the linear algebra and, calc and calculus works to keep up now. Or you can just take, uh, I guess you can take uh, ASIF's uh, math class. That's definitely going to help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that will be a little, um, yeah, you learn calculus a little bit. Well, it uh, moves into linear algebra and uh, probability theory. Do you do probability in uh, high school? Not that much, actually. It's mostly um, it's mostly just calculus. Yeah, it it will be a stretch zone for you. Huh? So, yeah, welcome to sit through that if you wish. Yeah, but uh, you you might feel quite lost. Or you, you can you can gauge. You can sit through a couple and see whether you want to or not. By the way, uh, in hindsight, this works, This uh, course is almost coming to an end. Given a choice all over again, would you register? I mean, honestly, would you think or you think you would wait a couple of years, mature a bit more and then take it? I think I, if there was, um, if this course was offered within the next couple months, I think I would look over everything and then do it again. But 
I think I still would be able to understand it if I was to do it within the next year or so. Okay, good. Remember, you can keep repeating it. Whenever I offer, you're most welcome to come join us. So I was wondering um, what would come after the ML200 course? So now we are entering the math course. And uh, in September, we are starting the very, very, very exciting and contemporary topic of deep neural networks. If you talk to uh, your uh, papa, if you talk to uh, Sachin, uh, he will tell you that uh, deep something called deep learning or deep neural networks mm -hmm. is a hot topic. That's about uh, self-driven cars and facial recognition and, you know, uh, understanding text and so forth. Machine learning can do a lot of things nowadays. And all of them are based on a class of algorithms called deep neural networks. So the September onwards, it will be all about deep neural networks. So I'm assuming in order to do that, it'd be good to have a good foundation, right? This is it. This was the preparation for it today. You are, uh, if you did this course, you are essentially ready for deep neural networks now. The upcoming math will help a little bit, but not much. I mean, it sort of makes you a little bit more comfortable by just by reviewing the math for you. But deep neural networks is a can, literally like where we stop here in this regularization. It literally is the doorway. It is something you use in deep neural networks also. That's why I was very focused on making sure we did this in class. And uh, in a way, right, the intellectual depth, like this is as intellectually heavy as it will ever get. It won't get any heavier than this. In fact, this is the core. Uh, the same theory applies to deep neural network. And uh, if you can get this part right, then pretty much you have gotten the heart of machine learning because the same thing repeats itself over and over again in machine learning. This whole idea of writing a loss function and minimizing it and doing gradient descent. Asif, how do you get to, how do you get to break down your topics? It's so it's so well. Um, so well placed and um, spaced out that like like well, as soon as you finish one module, it automatically steps up in difficulty, but at the same time, you don't feel so left out. So oh. to structure your classes in such a way that, yeah, topics, just, uh, they sound so smooth. <laughs> yeah. No, Patrick, that's the whole point, actually. I don't uh, structure my course at all. Uh, this is one of the things, there's a whole field, you know, there's didactics and pedagogy. How do you teach the education, the methods of teaching? So the world is filled with methods of teaching. And uh, most of those methods say that you should have a plan, lesson plan. You should know what you're teaching. Your material should be there. You should have slides and you should uh, itemize it. And so the whole process is very intellectual. But actually, um, right from the beginning, uh, since 30 years ago, I've never followed a method. Uh, like, I just teach the way I understand it. And I myself, frankly, never know what I'm going to teach in a given day. I know the broad topic. Like, for example, today I knew I would teach regularization. So last time I knew that I taught Minkowski and all of that in preparation for that. But beyond that, you know, in very broad strokes, I have an idea what I'll do but I never do that. So people who repeat my class will tell you that the same class the next time is quite different. Uh, I don't know. Mridal, Anil, would you agree with that? Each time it comes out different? Uh, yes, so this time it is completely different than the last time. Right. It has like more depth and more width compared to last time. Right, but even the explanations, no? the uh, are yes, yeah. Uh, this time like the intuition is getting much more clearer. <laughs> Right. See, it's even more impressive as if. Yeah. See, the thing is, one basic rule that I always tell that if you have to take notes to a classroom, you have not understood the subject. It means you don't know. If, if a professor is carrying notes, a teacher is carrying notes and looking at notes while teaching, it means that the person really doesn't understand the subject, thinks he understands, he knows it. I mean, he knows it, but doesn't know it at depths. Because if you know it, that's in your heart, you know, you walk into a room, like for example, when I sit here, 
I'm not looking at any notes. And you guys have seen me teach in the class. I just walk up to the stage with empty hands, isn't it? All my life I've done that. I've gone with empty hands, no notes, no preparation. And uh, I teach from what I know. And so then it flows, you know, there's a natural flow because in your mind, there is an order. Uh, there is a structure, there is a sort of a natural progression of ideas and that sort of flows through. And that's the way it has been with me. There's a, there's a quite a famous uh, lecture by Patrick Winston, how to teach, if you want to watch that, like. Uh, I've watched, I've watched yeah. it, Patrick Winston. Yeah. Sorry? No, please go ahead. Finish your thoughts. No, no, the, the, you know, not on lecture itself, but, you know, how to, how to take a class. Like, I think that's the way you are also taking it. That's very yeah. interesting. Yeah, right? that's it's mechanics is there. See, what, have, what Patrick says is that in the beginning, tell. So first thing he says is uh, audiences, I mean, some mistakes people do. A professor will start with a joke. People are not there to listen to your joke and they're yes. <laughs> the class. You know, they're still getting adjusted to the uh, classroom and they're sitting down, and people are entering. That's not the moment to joke around in the beginning. So you, you say what you're going to teach, right? You say explicitly what you will teach, then teach it and then summarize that you have taught that. It's important to do that. And the other th thing that Patrick makes a big deal about is that never teach, like teach in circles. You know, right. keep coming back to it and reteaching it. And you notice that uh, I try to always do that. Keep repeating things as I go along. Okay. Repetition is important because learning is circular. We sort of spiral our learning spirals up. Okay. Uh, we keep on going over the same material, but every time we go over it, the understanding deepens. And you have to do that in teaching. So there are people, you know, the trouble with slides is, when people write slides, obviously they don't have repetition because they, they don't want to have a slide which is exactly the same as the slide before or very similar to that. All the slides have new material. It's linear, but human beings don't learn in a linear manner. They learn, they learn in a very uh, sort of a non-linear way. We, we learn by going in circle and Patrick makes quite a, quite a big point of it and I completely agree with that. And the storytelling. And storytelling. And uh, mm -hmm. the thing that never go to the, I mean, in a way, Feynman once said that, the, the great physicist, uh, Feynman said that uh, if you cannot explain something in simple words, just mm -hmm. like that, it means that you may know the thing, know the theory, but you have not understood it deeply. Okay. Right? So uh, there's a very interesting thing at one point there was some topic he was explaining and, I, and people weren't getting it. Students weren't getting it. He tried and he tried again and he tried again. And when they don't, didn't get it, any other professor would have gotten frustrated and said, what Dumbo students. To his great credit, he actually walked off the stage. He says, it means I don't understand it. And then a few months, so I heard the story that a few months later, he came with a fundamental breakthrough in the theory of it. He reformulated a different way, a different theory to explain it, which was elegant and simple. Right. That's the beauty of this subject. And I, for me, it is very important. And this is where I disagree with a lot of educational methodologies. If you teach, see, when, when a child comes running to the mother and says, explain this to me, mm -hmm. say, okay, let me, let me bring up my PowerPoint and let's go over it carefully. You just, the child, the mother just explains whatever the child is asking for in simple terms, a little toddler, right? And uh, all of uh, learning, you know, it's a, it's a sharing between friends. When you ask your friend for something, your friend doesn't pull out a PowerPoint. You just talk as friends and uh, the conversation is a conversation of learning. And I've always felt that when I teach, I'm, I'm having a conversation with friends rather than a formal event with slides. I've never had that. To me, it's sharing. It's, you know, being with friends and having a conversation. Yeah, so I said that is the yeah. principle of uh, simplicity, right? Uh, yeah. What you just explained? Yeah, yeah, it's just, if it is not simple, yeah. 
something is wrong. Uh, Dirac used to make a big deal about it, Dirac the physicist. He would say he came upon an equation, the, the so-called famous Dirac equation, uh, which was elegant and simple in, uh, and started the whole field of relativistic quantum mechanics. When he did that, unfortunately, it predicted antimatter. In those days, nobody had seen, people had seen electron, proton, neutron. Nobody had seen an anti-proton or anti-electron, uh, positron. And it was embarrassing. Uh, but he looked at the theory and he felt that it is so elegant, so beautiful, so simple, that it must be true. And so he stuck to his guns. He says that if it predicts antimatter, antimatter must exist. And well, soon in a few years, antimatter was discovered. It's very amazing, actually, that nature at its foundations and all of these things, there is so much simplicity and elegance. That's why I love machine learning, that there is so much of simplicity. The deeper you go, the simpler it becomes. Most subjects, the deeper you go, the more complex it becomes. Yeah the more you have to remember. But with mathematics and the, these sort of fields, um, mathematical physics and machine learning, the deeper you go, the less you have to remember because everything has simplified itself into some core concepts. I agree, I see. Yeah. That's, that's why math is very appealing also to me. Oh, yes, yes. Coming from, coming from a, a terminology heavy field, it's, it's really different. The, it starts complex, but the deeper you go and the deeper understanding you get, yeah, it starts to it starts to iron out, and you see the simplicity and elegance and the equations and the code. Yeah, yeah, math is very interesting. Actually, most of the difficulty people have in math is in getting started with math. You can see people in high school really struggling with math, right? And they don't like it because you know they don't have the intellect. The muscles, the mathematical muscles haven't developed. And unfortunately, people give up. They never discovered the joy and beauty of math. But people who persist, you talk to any mathematician and you ask, why do you do it? He says, what else is more fun in the world? That's how they'll talk. They're just having fun. And they're just completely enamored with the beauty of the subject. All right, guys, I'll end today with this. All right, thank you, Asif. Oh, thank you, Asif. Bye, guys. Thank you. Uh, welcome.